Good evening, everyone, and welcome. I would like to call this meeting of the Bloomington City Council to order tonight, Monday, uh, March, what is today? March 21st, 23rd, uh, 2020. 21st, excuse me, 2020. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I will note this is our first time back as a council in literally two years, our first time back completely. So <laughs> we're very glad to be here. Believe me. We have a very special uh, treat here as we are back in person, uh, the presentation of the colors by the Bloomington Honor Guard. So right now I'm going to turn it over to Chief Hartley. Chief. Thank you, Mayor. Honor Guard, present colors. <laughs> Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you very much to the Bloomington Honor Guard for that. It always adds to the meeting in so many special ways, and I appreciate that. And uh, the reason that they are here tonight is we've got a swearing in of nine new officers, of Bloomington police officers. We'll get to that in just one second. First of all, we officially have to call the roll of the city council. Mr. Brillard. Councilmember Carter. Present. Coulter. Present. D'Alessandro. Present. Lohman. Here. Martin. Present. Nelson. Here. Mayor Bussey. Here. All seven members of the Bloomington City Council present and accounted for. And just to be uh, clear and on the record, that means with everybody here, we'll be doing voice votes tonight, so we don't have to do roll call votes. Again, Yay! First time in two years. <laughs> Wonderful. So, very good. Uh, next up is our approval of our agenda. Uh, as I said, we've, we've got something very special tonight, swearing in of new officers and council. I would like to offer a couple of different changes to our uh, agenda, if possible. I would like to move item 5.1 up ahead of item 4.1, so we can do our swearing in of our new officers and, and make sure that we get them all sworn in while we've got a nice full house here and everybody can get the pictures they need. And then council, I would like to also offer, uh, I know a lot of folks are here to hear about item 8.2, our council rules or procedure amendment discussion. I would also like to uh, recommend moving that after the introductory items before the consent business. So to move 8.2 up to uh, in between items 5 and 6, if that would be okay. And uh, for the folks that are here for this, what I would like to do also, uh, understanding that we're going to have the discussion, we'll have the conversation. I know a lot of folks have a lot of input. What I would like to do is uh, offer a 20-minute public comment period on this topic. Let me limit speakers to three minutes so we can get through as many people who would like to speak as possible. And then we'll uh, continue the council discussion on that. Uh, beyond that, beyond our consent business, we have uh, just a couple of public hearings tonight on the council member district ordinance and polling place resolution that we need to get done by tonight, or I believe all council salaries are frozen if we don't get that done by state law. And then uh, city, code amendments, uh, city code amendments allowing dogs in outdoor dining areas, talking also in an organizational business as a study item, our food truck standards, and then as I said, the council rules of procedure, which we would move up. So, council, any Questions or suggestions or thoughts on that? So if not, I would move the agenda with those changes as noted, moving item 5.1 up ahead of item 4.1 and moving 8.2 in between uh, items 5 and 6 on the agenda. Second. 
We have a motion and a second by Councilmember Lohman to approve tonight's agenda as stated and amended. No further council discussion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Motion carries 7-0. We have an agenda. Thank you all very much. So uh, item 5.1, the swearing in of our new officers. Always a great evening, uh, always a great thing when we have uh, the swearing in at one of our council meetings. So I'd like to call forward uh, Police Chief Hartley to introduce the item and make sure that we can get this kicked off. Chief Hartley, please. Well, good evening, Mr. Mayor, members of the council. Uh, it's an honor to stand before you as always. This is always an exciting night. We've got a lot of folks here. Um, I, I'd like to be able to tell you that we've been hiring, but you can see for yourself. And uh, <laughs> I think what's important to know that this represents uh, three different hiring processes that we have for the Bloomington, or Bloomington Police Department. One is the traditional, where we tend to get people from other agencies who want to come and work for this fine department. Uh, an internal promotion that, uh, uh, utilizes and, and kind of develops community service officers for an internal promotion to uh, uh, police officers. And then lastly, pathways to policing, which is a non-traditional pathway to becoming a police officer, utilizing a, a past or experiences that aren't necessarily wrapped in criminal justice. And so uh, nine individuals, uh, we're getting ready to hire eight more, so this will continue. But uh, I'm excited because uh, in a time where we have a lot of people who are choosing not to go into law enforcement, uh, these folks have made that decision. They're going to serve this community. They're going to serve it well. Uh, a lot of them are already out of training, and they're on their own, and they're doing exceptionally well. And, um, again, uh, it's a testament to those that are training uh, officers for our department. And also, like I said, that uh, we still have people that want to go into this fine profession and serve this community. And, uh, again, they will serve us well. Um, I would just, like I said, on a night like this, uh, and I don't think it needs to be reminded, but uh, you know they've got a full career ahead of them, and uh, they're human beings. And I think you can tell by the crowd behind them, they're supported in a lot of ways. These are sons, daughters, husbands, wives, uh, and and I just would ask that you keep that in mind as you continue forward, and you, um, as you always have supported this police department, you keep that in the back of your mind. Um, to steal a quote from an individual who will be coming in on April 4th and assume the uh, head of this department, assume positive intent. And I really think that uh, if we do that, uh, we are, we're heading in a great direction and we owe it to these people that have committed themselves to serving this great city. So with that, I am gonna go down the line and uh, before I call the city clerk up, just introduce, um, I don't even have badge numbers because it's not on here, but this is Kaylee Witt, Dasha Kolashuk, Cassandra Angles, Anglin, Leonard Nelson, Kevin Trong, David Rodriguez, Sam Davern, William Miller, and John Jones. So I will call the city clerk up at this time for the swearing in. Let me suggest this. Officers, if you would come and face out because as Great much idea. as I enjoy seeing you and I'm so very glad to see you, I think your family would like to see you more. So if you would come and face out. <laughs> And have our city clerk will do the swearing in facing this way. So you why can don't actually you come go on, on this side of the dive. Why don't you come on up here? Yep. Yeah. You can stand right here in front of us. Yes. Please. Okay, well, you start here and then just angle yep. this way. And I will say, uh, family members. Yeah, you just fill in here. She's, yeah. This is going to happen once, so get your best shot and don't be shy about it. Uh, if you need to come up to the front of the of the room and do this, I encourage you to do it. Please, uh, don't do not be shy. Get up here and, and get this done. Ms. Scipioni. Raise your right hand. Please state your first and last name. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will support the Constitution of the United States. That I will support the Constitution of the United States. And the state of Minnesota. And the state of Minnesota. And will faithfully discharge the duties. And will faithfully discharge the duties. As a police officer for the city of Bloomington, Minnesota. As a police officer for the city of Bloomington, Minnesota. To the best of my judgment and ability. To the best of my judgment and ability. Congratulations. So real quick, why don't you guys just 
back down around here, and this is the fun part. You get to hear uh, quickly from uh, the new officers. So Kaylee, we'll start with you. Uh, good evening, Mayor, City Council, City Manager. My name is Kaylee Witt. I uh, grew up right here in Bloomington, went through all stages of school here. I uh, have a bachelor's degree in psychology and criminal justice and a two-year degree in Spanish. And uh, prior to getting promoted to a police officer, I was a community service officer with the city of Bloomington. So very excited to be here. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, City Manager. My name is Dasha Kolshuk. I was a CSO here for two years. During that time, I got a bachelor's in criminal justice and management. I have an associate's in law enforcement. Um, just super excited to be here and part of the department and continue my career here. Thank you. Mayor, City Council, City Manager. My name is Cassandra England. Um, I grew up in Bloomington. I obtained my bachelor's degree from Mankato State in pre-law pre political science with a minor in law enforcement with an internship in corrections. Shortly after I graduated, I began working with the Department of Corrections for seven years before I was um, lucky enough to get hired through the Pathways program here and went through the schooling process through Pathways and simultaneously uh, graduated with my master's degree from Concordia St. Paul. So here I am. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, City Council, City Manager. My name is Leonard Nelson. I'm from Sacramento, California. I know it's far. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I played football. I played uh, four years of collegiate football at the University of North Dakota. I got two bachelors of criminal justice and sociology. My law enforcement as well as Cassie is from the Pathways at Hennepin Tech. Prior to that, I did a security right after uh, college. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, City Manager. My name is Kevin Trong. I grew up in uh, Woodbury, Minnesota. I attended college at the University of Minnesota where I graduated my bachelor's degree in sociology of law, criminology, and deviance. And uh, prior to here, I actually started my law enforcement career in Bloomington as a CSO back in 2013. And I spent the last six years or so as a police officer in Minneapolis. And I'm just excited and happy to be back where I started. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening, Mayor, City Council, City Manager. My name is David Rodriguez. I was born and raised in South Minneapolis, Minnesota. I have a bachelor's degree in criminal justice from the University of Northwestern St. Paul. And prior to serving with this department, I was a police officer with the Minneapolis Police Department for three years. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, City Manager. My name is Sam Davern. I was born and raised in Bloomington, Minnesota. I attended Normandale for my associate's degree in law enforcement, and I was also a community service officer here before uh, being promoted. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, City Manager. My name is William Miller. Uh, I grew up in Farmington, Minnesota. Prior, uh, my education is Normandale Community College. Prior to, or prior experience, 15 years in North Carolina as a police officer. Good evening, Mayor, City Council, City Managers. <laughs> I knew I was going to be the one to do it. <laughs> My name is John Jones. I grew up here in Bloomington, Minnesota. I am. Um, attended high school at Kennedy before transferring my senior year to Henry Sibley for athletic reasons. <laughs> <laughs> I got my associate's degree in law enforcement from Rasmussen later in life. I'm very excited to be here. And then uh, my prior work experience, I've worked in the Bloomington Public School District for probably 10 years. Thank you. Well, I want to say welcome and congratulations to all of you. I am absolutely thrilled to have you on board, and I hope you know you're, you're joining the best police department in the state of Minnesota. And uh, with that comes the responsibility to, to maintain that, that culture, that excellence, that, that uh, outstanding police service that we've come to expect in Bloomington, and I fully expect it and would think nothing less of all of you. So thank you so very much. 
really looking forward to seeing more of you uh, in and around City Hall, in and around the City of Bloomington. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Council, and just a note to the family, uh, we won't have to sit through an entire City Council. So, uh, <laughs> we're going to escape up to the uh, the Hag Room for a reception, so uh, you can uh, certainly... Before everybody ducks out here, uh, I think it's important to note uh, you're joining a fantastic department that is led by some fantastic people, and one of those fantastic people is attending his last City Council meeting tonight. Uh, our interim police chief, Mike Hartley, uh, has served as uh, interim for more than a year now and has served uh, the, the city for decades in an outstanding capacity. He is basically, he's one heck of a guy. He really is, and we're going to miss him terribly. And uh, wish you all the well, Chief, all the best, Chief. Uh, wish you well in your retirement. Uh, I know something tells me you're going to enjoy it. Something tells I me. So. <laughs> I think so. You're going to do well in it. Uh, hopefully you do as well in your retirement as you have as chief because uh, you, you've just been so fantastic for this community. So thank you thank so you. very much. I really appreciate that. Thank you. And also one last uh, tradition we have before you go, uh, if you could, uh, I know the council would like to congratulate you all individually. So come on up uh, one at a time, work your way around, and then you can head out to your reception. for our champions, people who love us the most. That's it for two hours now. That's it for two hours for moving around. All right, as we get everybody settled back in here, that's always a nice way to start the meeting. I like that. And we will continue with our agenda. We're going to move on to item four, which is our public comment period, and uh, which is a 20-minute period at the start of each council meeting where we allow members of the public to address the council on items not on tonight's agenda. 
And we start our public comment period with item 4.1, which is a response to the prior meeting's comments. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council Members. We had several uh, commenters at the prior meeting. Only one asked for a specific follow-up. That was uh, Mr. Andrew Thule, especially on the issue of uh, the carts, the wayward carts along uh, American Boulevard and in that uh, area. And the, the issue here is that uh, we often have uh, folks who are taking shopping carts from retailers in that area, and uh, most often they're they're headed to a a, a bus line or a transit uh, connection somewhere, and the carts get left there on the streets. And uh, Mr. Thule is correct that that is a it, it is a visual um, impairment, I think, on the on the cityscape. Uh, so he asked what we could do. So our staff is currently looking at a couple of issues. One is that um, we know that a couple other cities uh, have adopted ordinances related to um, carts. Uh, we're studying those ordinances. Uh, we're looking at what it would cost for our staff um, to uh, set up some uh, regular sweep or pickup uh, schedule uh, when we know that there are carts out there, what the cost would be so that we can determine appropriate fee that we would then assign to uh, retailers either to uh, pick up the cart if they wish to come reclaim it or perhaps to just destroy it uh, if they don't come and pick it up. So we have a couple different options that we're looking at. What we're trying to avoid is becoming a service provider for retailers to be the, the you know, the the catcher of wayward carts, and um, you know we <laughs> we don't we got an animal control officer that takes care of the of the live animals that get away. We don't want to have somebody that's responsible for inanimate objects around here doing the same work. But um, I think that based on what we've seen in other cities and um, uh, what we can do through our uh, fee um, uh, schedule, we should be able to come up with something in the not too distant future and bring forward a, an ordinance for council to consider. We'll also reach out to the retailers uh, and uh, make sure that before we make any decision, they're included in that process as well. Thank you for that, Mr. Verbrugge. And yes, I, I would agree, reach out to the retailers and maybe uh, let, let's make it in such a way that uh, maybe we entice them to eliminate this problem on their own. I think that would be the way to go. So, council, any questions? Council member? Nelson. <laughs> Council members, is your, is, your, is your microphone on? It is now. There you go. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> See, I don't even know how to use the technology anymore. <laughs> Two years. Um, I just wanted to follow up. Um, uh, Ms. Ness had asked some questions or had brought some information with regards to concerns about decisions by the police to... Um, uh, maybe not enforce uh, ordinances. And um, I had asked for some additional information about the circumstances of that. If you're not prepared to answer that tonight, that's fine. But I, I still would like to get some additional information on the circumstances of those decisions and, and what led to those decisions, uh, if we could, so. Okay, Mr. Rui. We will do that, Mr. Mayor and Council Member Nelson. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Council, any other questions? If not, we will move on with our public comment period, item 4.2. As I said, a 20-minute period at each council meeting where we uh, allow individuals of the public up to five minutes to address the council for items not on tonight's agenda. Uh, as I, I say every time we do this, it's not a back and forth. It's an opportunity for the council to listen, and then we respond accordingly at the, the next meeting, the subsequent meeting, uh, as we just heard here. Uh, we did have one person call ahead. Uh, Sarah Silva, I think, called ahead and asked to, to speak at our public comment period, so I would like to call her up first and speak to us. Good evening. If uh, if you could introduce yourself and as you as you finish up, if you could sign in as well, so we have you officially for the record. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, there we go. We have a little presentation. Perfect. Nice. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Mayor Bussey, City Council members. City Council, uh, City Manager. Um, this is Lissa Weimelt, co-founder of Maria's Voice, and I'm Sarah Silva, Executive Director of Maria's Voice. We really thank you for listening tonight. Um, we want to start by expressing our deep condolences to the family, friends, and community of Kelly Goodermont. Um, she was recently murdered and was a um, resident here in Bloomington. We're really sorry to hear of her loss. Um, we're again left shocked and in grief from another brutal murder from domestic violence. 
This affects all of us so deeply and leads us to why we're here tonight to talk to you. Um, we're here to ask the City of Bloomington to provide a domestic violence prevention education program to your city employees. The program is working to prevent domestic violence before it happens, and this program is called Maria's Voice Prevention Network. Thank you, <clears throat> Thank you and hello, Council. How are you? Um, again, I am Maria, um, Maria's mom, Alyssa Weimelt. Oh, it's, I've, I've got it over that. There you go. Well, we, don't want that. we don't want that. There we go. Um, Maria's voice was formed in honor of Maria Pugh, and Maria Pugh is Bill. My husband is right here. Uh, it's Bill and my daughter, and it's also Sarah's cousin. And Maria was murdered in her home in Maple Grove by her husband in April of 2020, uh, 10 years after she graduated from Bloomington Jefferson High School. Maria was 28 years old. Uh, she was a college grad, she was in a new marriage, and she was excited about her future. But instead, Maria was one of 28 people murdered by domestic violence in 2020 in Minnesota. Our story is really an important one because Maria could be anybody's daughter, a cousin, a granddaughter, a neighbor, a coworker, or a friend. And our family is like a lot of other families. We knew nothing about domestic violence. Even though we are aware people and connected to others in our business and social communities, we did not know that abusers have common behaviors. It isn't talked about publicly. We didn't learn about domestic violence in school or in any prevention program. So how would we have known? In talking to many experts um, and uh, people who know the domestic violence field, including survivors, we have found that our experience is a really shockingly common one. It's also shocking when you really consider that 34%, 34% of Minnesota women, 25% of Minnesota men, experience intimate partner physical violence, rape, and or stalking in their lifetimes. And with COVID, these numbers have increased up to 33% more. So it's very likely that everyone here, people behind me, the council in front of me, knows someone in an abusive situation, whether you are aware of it or not. So what our communities are experiencing demonstrates the urgency for everyone to be aware and educated about domestic abuse. So how does a focus on preventing domestic violence before it happens benefit the city of Bloomington? Well, the Maria's Voice Prevention Network educates on the three pillars of prevention, awareness, education, and safe action. Our program features a prevention education video presented by seven diverse educators. The video can be housed on your employee portal or easily accessed through an emailed link. Also included are print materials for employee and also public use that are educational and also refer to professional resources, as well as speaker opportunities. Now I want to just talk about the impact of educating your employees um, of the city of Bloomington. So there's a public health metric that says each person interacts with eight people per day. That means that with your around 1,000 employees of the city of Bloomington could have the knowledge to watch for the signs of domestic abuse in their 8,000 interpersonal interactions they have every day. Awareness leads to prevention, and that is the power of the prevention network. This comprehensive education program puts a safety zone around every community member by having aware and informed family, friends, neighbors, and coworkers. The city of Maple Grove has fully implemented our prevention program with their 550 plus employees, um, along with other employers, faith communities, and legions. Um, the Osseo Maple Grove Legion with their 1,100 members have fully onboarded our program. Ms. Silva, excuse me? I'm sorry, your five minutes are up. And, and, and I appreciate the message you're, you're, you're sharing with us. We do kind of stick to the rule to make sure everybody has the, the same amount of time. But thanks a lot. Appreciate your information. Uh, it, if you have you passed it on to folks here. In so the we've city? presented with um, Mike Sable, and we'll be following up with him. And we'd really appreciate your support in this um, initiative to bring this prevention education to your employees. Very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. So thanks much. for being here this evening. 
Is there anyone else in the chambers wishes to speak at public comment period? Items not on tonight's agenda. Please. Did you miss me? <laughs> it's been a couple months. My name's Rick Oliva. Um, and yeah, this is not on the agenda. I've been talking to you for a couple months about my views of the city's approach to racial equity and racism in the city. And I, I really had to think, what is my ultimate goal in all of this? My ultimate goal is that I want to uh, live in a city where I feel like I'm judged by the content of my character and not by the color of my skin. And right now I don't feel that, and so I want to share with you sort of my perspective. Um, I've read uh, some of the emails, so I already know how some of you feel about my character, but that's, that's a whole other <laughs> issue. Um, this isn't a new topic for me. I just took a trip to Daytona Beach, and my dad told me a story he said, yeah, the first time I was at Daytona Beach, I was with a couple other ball players, and uh, they had just integrated the beach, and a little white kid said, hey, can you guys make monkey noises? Um, I grew up hearing stories like that, and so I've al it's always been in the back of my mind. And today is not the 1960s, and so I, I, I want us to stop pretending like we haven't made any progress. We've made a lot of progress, and I feel like we've come so close then there's little things that happen that kind of set us backwards. I think a lot of times it's unintentional. I want to give you one example of that. Um, and let's, I'm going to take the tobacco versus alcohol in the city. Um, we, we identified racism as a public health crisis here. We try to do things to, to help that. The statement in, in not having menthol, cigar or having menthol cigarettes included in the tobacco ban so the tobacco industry has used menthol flavors to racially segment and target certain customers, especially black Americans, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, and queer communities, and youth. So we are using that, we're using race as a thing to get rid of menthol cigarettes. We aren't getting rid of regular cigarettes. We aren't getting rid of the cigarettes that white people like, is how I read this. Whether that's your intention or not, that's kind of what you're leaving out is what you're saying is that black people like menthol, white people don't, so we're getting rid of the menthols. So then I ask, well, why don't we get rid of alcohol? That's a much bigger problem, in the, especially in the black community. And paraphrasing the result is, well, we can have that, we, we can have a drink responsibly. Well, I can have one cigarette and not die. I have friends that have died from alcohol. I've, I'm a musician, I played at funerals of people who were killed by impaired drivers. Yeah, it sucks, especially when it's a kid. But I'm going to read this article. Uh, uh, this article is on a national, the NIH.gov, uh, National Institute of Health, Alcohol Consumption and Demographic Subpopulations. Large national surveys, such as the National Epide Epide Epidemiologic Survey on Alcohol and Related Conditions, the National Survey on Drug Use, and health found that young adults 18 to 25 were particularly high risk of alcohol use disorder and an unintentional injury caused by drinking. These surveys furthermore identify significant variability in alcohol consumption and, to, and its consequences among racial ethnic groups. White respondents reported the highest prevalence of current alcohol consumption, whereas alcohol abuse and dependence were most prevalent among Native Americans. Native Americans and blacks also were most vulnerable to alcohol-related consequences. So once again, I read this and I say, we're going to do things to protect people's health, supposedly, but we're going to keep alcohol because white people like drinking. White people like regular old cigarettes. I don't even know what they're called. I don't smoke. Black people like menthols. We're getting rid of those, right? Racism, whether it's intentional or not, a policy system of government, et cetera, that is associated with or originated in such a doctrine and that favors members of the dominant racial or ethnic group or has a neutral effect on their life experiences. Now, I'm not saying smoking menthols is a good life experience. I think it's stupid, but smoking regular cigarettes is stupid too. But they're both legal products. So why would we ban one that black populations favor versus one that white populations favor? I'd say if you're gonna get rid of cigarettes, just get rid of all of them. I don't think you should do that, but if you're gonna just get rid of all of them and re really think in terms of how this is affecting people. 45 seconds left. Some of the messaging that I would change is I would make it about inclusion and not race, not have race-based goals. Things like um, evaluating job postings for racial bias, evaluate marketing for racial bias, evaluate placement, uh, ad placement for racial bias, things like that are things that, that absolutely you should do. 
And you should make it your goal to rid those things of racial bias, but not make the goal of, um, of like hiring or diversifying the, the, the city. I have a great thing I'm going to follow up with you all with regarding um, what happened to the Bloomington Public Schools. Uh, if you look it up there, I'll give you the preview in four seconds. It is called, I can't find it. I need my glasses. <laughs> the Bloomington Achievement and Integration Plan. Um, so I'll follow up with you. I'll send you that. Um, so thank you for your time, and uh, I'll be in touch. Thank you, Mr. Leva. We also have, I understand, uh, Sally Ness is on the line. She had pre-registered. I didn't get that note until just a moment ago. So, uh, Leah, if, uh, if you could patch, uh, or if you could connect Sally Ness in with us. Are you there, Leah? Yes, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Sally Ness, your line is open. You may now speak. Thank you. Good evening, Ms. Ness. Welcome. Make it. Thank you. Last meeting, I pointed out potential issues are not addressed promptly and that the reports made concerning an event at Darrell Fruit did not reflect the number of people who attended the event, the traffic generated, and the traffic issues. Tonight, I am going to point out that a statement made during a hearing for a conditional use permit to increase the number of students at the Private Business Success Academy in 2018 did not reflect the data. Yes, Success Academy is a private business, one that would file Chapter 11 and not Chapter 9 as a municipality would. During the 2018 hearing, the mayor states, and I even had happened to have the ability to have some conversation with Excel Energy. There is not a record of this conversation. There is no data to support there was ever a conversation. The data request 2019-175 was for a record of the city first contact to power company concerning the construction of the driveway from the Smith Park lot to Park Avenue and all follow-up communication. There was no data of any contact with the power company before September 10th, 2018, and no data of any contact between the mayor and the power company. A couple of months after the conditional use permit hearing, there is an email where the city attorney is asking planning who the contact is at Excel. Planning replies that someone is looking into it. A meeting is set for December 13th, 2018, and Excel Energy is re a required attendee. Excel is contacted again on April 5th, 2019, and the email clarifies that it is Darl Farouk that is in need of the driveway due to an ongoing issue at the facility of tra traffic circulation, which questions why the city provided any funds for a driveway it does not need, and questions why a council member would incorrectly state Darrell Farouk would be under no obligation to help pay for any of the driveway normally. About the ongoing issue at the facility, the following is a Facebook comment from a representative of the building. Yes, I am helping the traffic situation. No, I am not okay with any parking violation. I'm not okay with any semi-truck or big commercial vehicles in the quiet neighborhood. I'm not okay for our building to be in over-occupied. So I am helping our neighbors to come together and see each other as human beings and not a second class citizens. The representative knows the building is overused and non-compliant, but inaccurately implies the neighbors are not neighborly and that they negatively view others. And that the solution is not about addressing the overuse and non-compliant use, but to come together. The representative comments are inaccurate and harmful. About the land where the new driveway is constructed, a land use permit dated September 2nd, 1965 states for city park purposes exclusively. And that the driveway is for Dar al Farouk. And the data states it increases the fair market value and is a special benefit to the Dar al Farouk property. Again, the land use permit is for city park purposes exclusively. Once again, during the hearing for the conditional use permit for Dar al Farouk dated 9-10, 2018, the mayor states, and I even had happened to have the ability to have some conversation with Excel Energy. And once again, there is not a record of this conversation. There is no data to support there was ever a conversation. In an email dated August 21st, 2019, I did request a verification that the mayor does not have data concerning contact with Excel Energy concerning Darrell Farouk, Smith Park, and the driveway from Smith Park parking lot to Park Avenue. The reply was, the data you received from staff, city council, and mayor are complete and accurate. 
the reports and statements not reflecting the data is a concern that should be addressed along with the overuse and non-compliant use of Darrell Farouk. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Ness. Leah, do we have anyone else on the line who wishes to speak to item 4.2 or public comment period? We don't have anyone on the line, Mr. Mayor. You may continue. Thank you. Anyone else in the council chambers wishes to speak to item 4.2? Item not on tonight, tonight's agenda. May I get the overhead? Good evening, Mr. Thule. Yeah, evening. Uh, first off, uh, uh, Mayor, Manager, City Council, I just want to say thank you guys for addressing the uh, the CART issue. Uh, it was since uh, last July that I brought it up, so I appreciate the, the effort being put forth. One question I have about the CART thing, was there a conversation with Met Council? Because it does appear to be like a Met Council, not, not Met Council, but the public transportation, you know, the CARTs are congregated around. So, Mr. Verbrugge, if you could just please respond to that. It's a... It does seem like I just don't want to see the city on the hook for, you know, impounding them, doing all that work, if the Met Council would be willing to address that. So um, appreciate the response on that one. So, um, and uh, thank you, Lona, for your email um, to me um, <coughs> addressing that issue. So he pressed that forward. It's been a long time coming. Um, I just wanted to kind of touch on um, First Amendment. It says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to, to assemble and to petition the government for redress of, of, of grievances. Obviously, the people that are in these chambers, you know, behind me, they're concerned residents, you know, of, of, of this city. You know, they email, they speak, you know, they, they, they actually care about the city. And many of them have lived here for several, several years, me being 50. But uh, we email you because we care. So I just wanted to leave you guys with that. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thule. Anyone else wish to speak to public comment? Item 4.2, items not on tonight's agenda. Please. Mr. Mayor, Larry Frost. Uh, t first point, I'm here in two capacities. This is my personal capacity. I'm also covering this as a journalist. That's why I took my badge off. Um, I served for 27 years in the Marines and the Army. I did so specifically, one reason, to protect the United States Constitution. You attempting to close down the right to petition here in this Mr. chamber. Frost, this is on tonight's agenda, and I've offered an opportunity for folks to speak. I'm sorry, I thought that previous speaker was addressing that issue. Uh, he, he was a little more general, talking about the First Amendment. Very good, Mr. And I, I cut him some slack, but w w we've got this on tonight's agenda, and we've, had, we've offered an opportunity for people to address it. My name is Barb McIntosh. I've lived in Bloomington for 70 years. Ms. McIntosh, if I could ask, could you pull the microphone down a little bit in front of your face there so we can hear you a little bit better? Okay. My name is Barb McIntosh. I've lived in Bloomington for 70 years. Um, everybody, we all got our tax statements. We all got 50 grand or 70 or whatever added on. And I'm here to ask you if you would consider freezing the taxes for the seniors. A lot of the seniors can't afford to pay more taxes. A lot of us have lived here forever, and we're the ones that made the city what it was, Amen. and it was a good city. And now people are being booted out of their houses because they can't afford it. And that's what I'm asking. If you would find a way to try to freeze the taxes for the seniors because we aren't going to go use that water park. We aren't going to go use a lot of the things that you people are trying to put in. So why should we have to pay for it? We shouldn't. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Folks, we're not doing that, okay? This is, this is a public hearing. This is public, a public uh, meeting. It's not the, the Springer Show. It's a public meeting, and we'll, we'll talk our way through this, okay? Thank you for uh, really stressing my point. Thank you. I'm going to close the public comment period, and we're going to move on in our agenda now to item 
5.2, which is an update on the Highland Greens golf course. Our friends from Three Rivers Park District are here, as well as uh, Ann Catry, our Park and Rec Director. Uh, we also we have uh, Bo Carlson, who's the superintendent of Three Rivers Park, and uh, Mr. John Gibbs, who's our Park, Three Rivers Park Commissioner for the City of Bloomington. Good evening, Ms. Catry. Welcome. Thank you very much, Mayor Bussey, members of the council. Uh, it seems hard to believe that it was a year ago that we entered into a three-year agreement with Three Rivers Park District to operate Highland Greens Golf Course. Uh, and here we are, and we promised a report back annually uh, by Three Rivers Park District regarding the operations of the previous year. So this is our first report. Mayor, uh, already introduced, Mr. Gibbs. and uh, Mr. Mayor, members, we appreciate that you've got a full agenda this morning, so we won't belabor the point. But as Anne indicated just over a year ago, we came together and in that year we've jointly created an example of great government efficiency and I believe uh, a great outcome. So the city came to that conversation looking at about a $250,000 city budget challenge related to Highland Hills. Three Rivers came to that conversation with frankly, excuse the pun, but we were swamped with uh, <laughs> in our golf operations truly uh, a, a real load of, uh, of uh, demand, especially from the young and in the educational side of things. Together, we were able to get Highland Greens opened up, largely because of strong city council and city staff leadership and cooperation, and I think great leadership by Bo Carlson, the superintendent of the Three Rivers Park District, as well as Jeff May, who's the director of golf operations, and Mark Hill, who came to Bloomington here to help run Highland Hills. So as the commissioner from Bloomington and Eden Prairie and Richfield, you can count on me to take credit for these successes. Had almost nothing to do with it, but I'd like to introduce Bo to give a few of the details on it. Thank you, Mr. Gibbs. Mr. Carlson, good evening, welcome. Mr. Mayor, Council Members, thank you. Bo Carlson, I'm the Superintendent of Three Rivers Park District. And I do have just a few details, and it was an exciting season at Highland Greens. Um, a little bit of a rush, probably something we wouldn't normally want to jump into as quickly as we did. It was about a year ago, March, that we actually entered into an agreement to operate Highland Greens, and we had to kind of scramble to get things going. We had the driving range open on April 2nd. We had some nice spring weather. The course was a little delayed. We didn't get that open until April 19th, so we were a little behind where some of the other courses were going. Uh, but nevertheless, we had a full season, and I think a very positive season. We ended up going until October 31st, which is the last day of operation. So you can see a very full uh, golf operation. We did about 20,000 rounds last year, so we thought that was a very positive number considering the course was closed essentially the year before. Um, the really great news is we brought almost all the driving range traffic back. We hit about $125,000 in revenue at the driving range, which is the money or the uh, amount that we expected we would hit, we hoped we would hit. Um, so again, that's a real positive sign that it bounced back immediately, that folks started to recognize they could come back out and hit balls and, and hopefully enjoy the setting and the atmosphere that we were able to provide. There are a number of different things that we had to do over the course of the year, just some upgrades to the building itself, some improvements, just new carpet, new paint, some of those kinds of things, make it look a little bit fresh. We also redid all the um, sandboxes out on the golf course, make them a little bit more playable. We took a couple offline so we don't have them, so it is a little bit more playable that you're not going to get stuck out in those sand traps out there. And we had a number of trees that had to be removed based on either lightning strikes, disease trees, those types of things. So uh, we think all in all, general improvements to the playability of the course and the feedback was extremely popular. So we heard a lot of good things from folks that came back. We ended up getting seven of the leagues. We had about 12 leagues that were out there before coming back. Uh, the remainder of those, a couple of them just disbanded or they found other places to play. So uh, we'll keep drawing more and more. The good news as well is that we brought back the Bloomington Jefferson and Kennedy High School teams that practice both at the driving range and on the course. So that's great to have them there and have them as our or our course being the home course for those two schools in the city of Bloomington. We're extremely excited about going into the 2022 season, not only in the idea that we had a whole off season to prep and prepare uh, for going into the year, but it really was an opportunity for us to develop our golf curriculum and our programming. And that's one of the signatures of the Park District. It's one of those things that we do and we're very proud of. It's our first tee program where we teach both youth programs, senior programs, as well as adult programs 
Um, and we have a full catalog of offerings this year that are going to be offered down at Highland Greens. We were not able to do that last year just because of timing. Uh, our golf catalog had already gone out by the time we had secured the agreement. So we were scrambling a little bit with providing lessons. We provided about a third of what we hope to provide this year. And our lesson curriculum opened up on March 2nd. Um, we had very positive feedback in those first couple weeks. And right now, uh, we're about three times what we were in revenue all of last season in golf instruction. So we're getting a lot of people coming out for those course offerings. We've got over 50 course offerings that we have right now, and that's from junior programmers, beginning golf programs to adult leagues and those types of things. So super excited to see those numbers. We got a number um, that have filled already and a number that are still very much open. So we hope to encourage people to check out those offerings, see those different programs and get them out there on a regular basis. All in all, last year, we had about a break-even year. So in spite of that shortened season and kind of the rapid uh, turnaround of getting things up and operational, we were able to make a go of it. So that just makes us that much more excited going into this full season where we can have that full complement of our instruction program. I think we're going to be in pretty good shape. And we're going to keep uh, our fingers crossed and hope for good weather like we had last year and the continued support of golf um, just from the general public as a whole. It's great to see golf bouncing back. Uh, from the Park District standpoint, 2020 was the best year we ever had in the golf business. And it really was reflective of one of the only things you could do in the midst of the pandemic. So a lot of people rediscovered golf. Well, 2021, we actually surpassed 2020. So we had an even better year last year. So I think more good things to come. We're going to stay very positive, And I think Highland Greens is going to be, be a big reason for that for us. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Happy to answer any questions. Council, any questions of Mr. Carlson? Council Member Nelson and then Council Member Coulter. Council Member Nelson? You have to turn. Okay, that's twice now. You gotta <laughs> no one taught me these things. <laughs> um, just one quick question. I appreciate all of the um, learning opportunities that you have there. And I know last year one of the things that, that went away was some of the BAA programming at Highland Greens. It's still there over um, at our other facility. In Juan in Dwayne's low area. So um, it, it was anything done? Were we able to work anything out with BAA to allow them back this year at Highland Greens? And Mr. Mayor, Council Member Nelson, we continue to have conversation with BAA. We would welcome them back and having a relationship with them. Our hope was really in this year to establish that core of what our curriculum looks like, but we welcome that. We have many relationships with local park and rec departments, local communities, and we would welcome some kind of offering that we could partner with them to provide programming there. We have had conversation. Okay. At least last year, they were kind of focusing their efforts on Duan, so it wasn't going to work out necessarily, but we welcome uh, coming back to the table and see what we can figure out. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate Council Member Coulter. Openness. Thank you, Mayor. I don't, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't have any particular questions. I just want to thank you for being here, and, and I'm just really, really thrilled to, to hear the positive report. I remember when we when we took this action, I, I said then that it it's tough to get to a win-win in this business, but this is about as close as I think we can get for both Three Rivers and, and for the city and for the continued operations of, of uh, Highland Greens. And I'm sure the mayor is really glad that you took out some of those sand traps. <laughs> <laughs> Councilmember Lomit. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm also appreciative of those as well. <laughs> those are God. In the trees, too. It's nice. The lightning has helped me as well. So um, uh, just a couple of quick questions here. Uh, uh, are we still doing foot golf over there? Has that kind of been... Um, uh, discontinued. Mr. Mayor, Council Member Lohman, we have taken the foot golf out. Um, we're still looking at what that area potentially could be used for, the old driving range location. Uh, at least at this point, we've been really focused on the course itself and the driving range, so we have not added foot golf back in. I know that when we um, looked at this um, some years ago, when this came before the council, there was a great deal of concern about the demographic shifts and changes in terms of the numbers as it relates to uh, golf in general. Ha have we seen a, I know obviously you, you mentioned 2021, have we seen also a shift and change in those demographic numbers 
when we look over the the long term, are we gonna, you know, are we gonna kind of see a, you know, everything everything kind of comes back to normal, and then you know, just you know, just I mean, I don't, you don't necessarily need to have any uh, statistics, but I'm just curious in terms of your professional opinion. Um, how are we preparing ourselves, you know, for that eventual uh, shift or change, or do we feel like we're we're set and ready to go long term? Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Lohman, that's a great question, and that's one of the things um, we are are certainly always watching. And I think back even four or five years ago when we were starting to see that shift, one of the real things Three Rivers really looked at was founding our system and grounding our system in that foundation of education and teaching kids. You're not going to have adults playing golf if you don't have kids playing golf. So we really built our first tee program around that idea that we want to build future golfers. And we've seen pretty good success. And even in the dips in the numbers, and this, again, is not necessarily just at Highland Greens. This is at all of our facilities. And we've got about five different golf facilities throughout the uh, western suburban Hennepin County area. Um, we've seen a pretty good flatline, or I shouldn't say flatline necessarily, but pretty steady traffic. And, and part of that's reflected that idea that we want to encourage kids to come out, families to come out, and really ground that. What's really changed, and anecdotally, um, it's been the pandemic. It's created much more flexible schedules. It's created an opportunity for people to come out in shorter stretches of time. People are working different hours when they're working remote. They can come out in the morning and play and still get their full day in at work, or they can midday in the afternoon go hit a bucket of balls and still get back and do the work that they need to do. We've seen a tremendous uptick in younger people playing, and by younger people I really mean that 20 to 40 age group, which is predominantly the group that has the ability to spend some money and does like to spend some money on that activity. So it's a good group to have it based on. Um, and what we're really seeing again is that those traditional trips to the golf course, which was 8 a.m. group of four carts and a cooler of beer, those po folks are still there. But now we have people coming in at 6 p.m. and 7 p.m. and still trying to squeeze in nine holes or people coming in at one o'clock in the afternoon and playing. So the sport is strong. I think everything that you talk to through MGA which is the Minnesota Golf Association, they would reiterate that, that they feel the uh, sport's as strong as it's ever been. Uh, just uh, anecdotally, again, they have a youth on course program, which is an opportunity for kids to get out and play at discounted prices. In fact, I think they pay about $5 a round. Um, they budget for that annually in the forty to $50,000 range, and they raise money mostly through donations and those types of things. Just for Three Rivers alone in 2020, they had a reimbursement program for the difference of what those fees were. They owed us about $200,000. So that's a great sign to the fact that kids are coming out and playing, uh, and they're coming out in good numbers. So we hope they'll stick with it. Well, thank you very much uh, for that assessment. I know you'd <laughs> like to get my daughter out there too as well. So uh, <laughs> we're working on that, and I always see the sign as I go down uh, Normandale, a little sign for uh, getting lessons. So appreciate that. Councilmember Nelson? Got it that time. So, um, and Mayor, this question is for you, but I, I'm just wondering when that fence is coming down. It, it was next on my list as well. <laughs> I knew, I knew, I just wanted to preempt you on that. I'd, lo I'd love to see the fence gone and a really nice sign. I, I would agree. Do we do we have a timeline on the fence? And I think you've got seven volunteers, maybe eight, to get Jamie involved uh, to get that fence down if you need help taking it down. Mr. Mayor, that's one we continue to work on. Uh, we had some bids last year that uh, I think were reflective of the pandemic and not really reflective of the market. Um, they were beyond what at least I would recommend for our organization in spending to take a fence down, which should not be an expensive proposition, but the prices that we were getting were staggering. So uh, we'll take another round at that and see what they look like and see what we can do to get that taken care of. And I know certainly our staff has been speaking with city staff related to signage. Uh, anything we can do to promote the course and promote opportunities for golfing uh, would be great right off of Normandale there. Absolutely. Thank you. Thanks for asking that, Councilmember Nelson. It was next on my list. So, any additional questions? <laughs> well, uh, thank you. And, and as Councilmember Coulter said, this has been an absolute win-win. I'm so glad to hear the success you folks had last summer and looking forward to this summer. And can't speak highly enough of the programming that you do in terms of teaching and getting kids involved. The first tee, my, my son played in the first tee 25 years ago down in Cleary Lake, I, I think. Commissioner Gibbs may have heard of Cleary Lake now and again. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I know what a wonderful program you guys put on. So thanks much. 
and uh, uh, give us updates as need be, and, and sure. we will look forward to uh, seeing you again about this time next year. So, great. Sounds good. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Mr. Thank Council. You, Council. Moving on in the agenda, item 5.3, which is a presentation of the 2020-21 and 2022 Advisory Board of Health Annual Report and their 2022 and 2023 work plan. And uh, you've all heard me before, I've been saying it for a, a month and a half now, two months, that uh, our city charter requires all of our commissions and uh, um, boards to report annually to us about their work plans and about their to uh, review the year, the year that they previously had. And so we've been working our way through them, and uh, it's our turn now for the Advisory Board of Health. And I would like to welcome uh, Dr. Dr. Nick Kelly. You're going to introduce this for us. And I know we also have uh, our co-chairs of the Advisory Board of Health, uh, Megan Wittet and Boo Mahani. Mayor, council members. Uh, tonight we have uh, Megan Wittet and Boo Mahani. Uh, Megan Wittet is our past chair, and Boo is our current chair. They're going to give us <clears throat> an update of what the board has been doing and what they're going to plan on doing this following year. So, Megan. Thank you so much. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, Mayor. Good evening, Council Members. Thank you for the opportunity to provide this overview for all of you. Um, it's always exciting for the opportunity to share some of the great information that we've learned and where we're hoping to go over the next year for the Advisory Board of Health. Uh, and I just want to start by saying that we've had an amazing uh, group of and very dedicated and passionate board members over the last year. And it's been my true pleasure to chair this board over the last two years and over the last year with this particular group. So really want to thank all of the board members for their passion and their dedication to the health and the safety of our city uh, of Bloomington residents. So with that, Mike, if you could pull, uh, go ahead and move it on to... Uh, perfect. Um, so again, this is just, again, some of the uh, amazing members over the last year uh, and just a privilege to be chairing this group over the last year. Uh, so I want to start by just providing some brief updates on what we have been, in, been informed on and learning about and taking a little bit deeper dive on over the last year. Uh, we started with receiving a presentation by the Minnesota Department of Health on the important work that they're doing around mental health and well-being. And we learned through that work some of the highlights of the many innovative projects that they're establishing throughout the state. And we continue as a board to learn about that important work and what they continue to do there. We also learned about the amazing work that OASIS and VEEP have been doing to support the community and some of their response to COVID-19. Next slide, please. We received some updates on the important tobacco work and we watched the city take policy action on the point of sale around a strong public health area and public health focus. So on April 26, the city council continued its leadership of protecting our youth and our marginalized communities against the harms of commercial tobacco products through bold and innovate, innovative policy work. This included voting on the prohibiting the sale of all flavored tobacco products, including menthol, and sunsetting the availability of the new tobacco licensed retailers in the city, which will eventually uh, reduce the number of retailers over, over several years. The flavoring changes took place on January 1, so we're very excited to see that happen. And then we're looking forward to those licensing changes that will be going into effect on June 30th. The public health work, the, the public health is closely working, working closely, excuse me, to make sure that the important areas of cessation materials and resources are available to our Bloomington communities and members for those who are interested or needing of those resources. So that's an important part of this policy, these policy efforts. I also want to share that we had um, some very informative, uh, informa uh, informative components around our environmental, the environmental health work that is happening at the, um, within the, uh, the foodborne illness uh, trends, as well as the investigations and the important work that they were doing around those COVID-19 clusters that happened, as well as their responses to the executive orders that were occurring around COVID-19. And then finally, I just want to mention all the great work that the staff at, the, at Bloomington Public Health are doing around 
COVID-19, and we were able to get those regular updates. We also learned about the important work they're doing around family health and WIC, and really thinking about the trends that we're seeing because of the pandemic. So, for example, the decrease in immunizations among our children in the Bloomington and what that might, how that can affect, of course, the future uh, childhood diseases that we might see within our future re- uh, residents. And, and so we want to make sure we're tracking those important trends that are happening over time as we're coming on t- out to the outside of the pandemic. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Boo. Uh, who is the new chair of the Advisory Board of Health, and he'll share some of the highlights that are what we're looking forward to as a board. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Chair. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, here we go. Thank you, Megan. Uh, looking forward to filling in some big shoes here. I think many members of the uh, Advisory Board of Health are, are all new, so we had to look to Megan to, to learn about uh, how this all works. Um, So to start off with, uh, I have to say, looking forward to the National Public Health Proclamation as that's coming up uh, pretty quickly. Um, And then as it comes to 2022 and the rest of the year, uh, the board coalesced around a couple of different categories of work with some interconnectedness between all of it. Um, And the three primary topics that we came to were climate change and food, housing and health, and then health in all policies. So first, when it comes to climate change and food, uh, we're focused on understanding the health impacts of climate change on the city of Bloomington with some interest in tackling uh, food access and security. So by understanding, identifying, and working to close potential uh, food deserts and supporting our local agriculture in the process. Uh, The board will also like to understand the housing health impacts of climate change. So thinking about things such as heat-related issues and and risks and flooding risks as as well that might arise as climate change continues to change. Uh, Next, there is housing and health. So there's a recognition that housing is a key driver of public health. So the board is interested in looking at and continuing to promote increased access to affordable housing, making our housing stock more resilient in the face of climate change, and continuing discussions around the multi-unit smoke-free housing and potential next steps uh, there as well. And then the third topic or category of work is health in all policies. Again, recognizing that improving public health can't be a siloed activity. Uh, So the board is really interested in supporting the city's work on this topic, uh, using this framework to understand health in all policy impacts to any presentations that we'll be receiving throughout the year, um, and then promoting the usage of this framework towards uh, policy solutions that are of public health interest um, throughout the many boards and commissions uh, that the city is involved in, such as housing and well-being. Uh, Next slide. And I think in addition to those uh, primary topics, uh, we expect to continue to receive updates related to the COVID-19 response and recovery, um, uh, continuing to track how the city is responding to racism as a public health crisis and the role of the board in that work. Um, and continue to look at, again, tobacco policy options to improve health. Uh, so understanding the impacts of some of uh, uh, the recent ordinances that we've passed, our current initiatives, and then laying the groundwork for potential uh, future policies as well. So a uh, lot of uh, work, uh, really excited, I think, as Megan mentioned, a uh, lot of really interested board members and, and look forward to bringing uh, any updates uh, as needed in the future as well. Very good. Thank you. Council, any questions of Chair Mahani, uh, Councilmember Lohman, and then oh, Councilmember Lohman. Councilmember Lohman. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so I did, um, I did see that uh, uh, throughout your presentation and uh, the materials, you talked about the housing uh, with multi-housing. I've been uh, very interested in that in terms of trying to see uh, if we can kind of bring that uh, to its conclusion. Um, but along with that, I am curious, as we're looking at housing just in general, will we also uh, have any look or view in terms of uh, disclosure of smoking and resident, regular residential, uh, uh, if you will be looking at that as, at all, uh, as you guys look at housing? Yeah. Uh, well, do you want to? Do you want to? So, uh, Mr. Mayor, Councilmember Lohman. That uh, the multi-unit smoke-free housing work, there is a lot of staff engagement right now on that, working with community development staff on what that looks like. Um, We have not had uh, additional discussions on disclosure, uh, but we can certainly look at doing that. 
Yeah, I just, uh, just if I could say just a few more things, we know what the effects of third hand, and, and now they're talking about fourth hand smoke. Um, and so I'm just very curious about, you know, if we are looking to try to uh, try to resolve the, the, that with the multi-housing, given the demographics of those folks that are most impacted uh, by that, uh, when we start moving towards affordable housing, that same demographic does happen to be there as well. And so I, I'm just curious that we, we don't, you know, miss it on the one end and then turn around and then, you know, create a different situation for uh, around affordable housing um, in that, that area. So I hope that we'll kind of look at those things at the same time. I know that the, the time frame and the work that staff has done is tremendous on the multi, so I wouldn't expect those to be at the same level. But I'm just curious about that if you would look at that. Thanks. Yeah, I think that sounds great and, and happy to take any feedback from the mayor and council back to the board as well and incorporate that into our work plans. Thank you. Councilmember Nelson and then Councilmember Carter. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, just a quick follow-up on one of uh, the people from public comment had mentioned domestic violence and talked about their program and its potential connection to public health. And I'm just wondering if that fits anywhere within your work plan, uh, if it's something you're looking at, um, if you're working with that group, um, or, or if it's something we, we could take a look at working with them on. Yeah, so currently that's not listed on our work plan. I uh, did take a note of that as that was being brought up. And again, happy to take that back to the board. we meeting again tomorrow and see if there's a way to incorporate that um, and, and what options there may be. Councilmember Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so first, I just want to thank Chair Whitt for your service over the past year. Um, really appreciate your leadership and your willingness to spend many hours uh, going to meetings and, and learning about topics and putting forth recommendations. Um, and so I guess my question, some of the topics brought up, I'm really excited about them. They're pretty high level at this point. And so is the idea to study, figure out what kind of recommendations you could put forth to the council. Um, and like, that's really the intended outcome. Yeah. So, uh, the, the, they, I agree. They, they are sort of a high level categories of work. The way that we structured our work plan, um, you'll notice for a lot of these topics, they come uh, twice or maybe even three times throughout the year. So the intention would be the first time that we look at it might be, you know, level setting on current state, what's happening, just understanding, um, you know, what, uh, what the situation related to these topics is, and then narrowing in on something more specific related to each one of these where we think there's something actionable that could be uh, done by the board or bring back a recommendation uh, to council. Great. Thank you for clarifying that. I will also say I second Councilmember Nelson's recommendation to add domestic violence to the list. Uh, I think back in 2020, we had a significant number of homicides in Bloomington, six or seven, and they were almost all related to domestic violence issues. And so shortly after that, uh, Chief Hartley, actually, I guess at the time it was Chief Potts and then Chief Hartley took over. And I met with Cornerstone, and they're doing some really great work um, in this area. But it has kind of bothered me ever since that it doesn't feel like we do enough on the prevention side. And so if there is more that we could be doing on the prevention piece, I think that would be really great information to have. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you for the feedback. And take that back to the board, too. Thank you. Council Member D'Alessandro. Uh, just m echoing um, the council members' discussions here around uh, thanking you all for your work, um, unprecedented times to be on the advisory board of health, and and uh, you all have um, managed it with a plum. So congratulations to all of you folks. Um, I, I as it relates to that, I'm I'm curious about um, what learnings you might have taken from that period of time and how you're applying it to your future work plan. Uh, no, you know, nobody is hoping that there's yet another massive thing that happens that kind of disrupts all of the things you had planned to do. Um, but if, in fact, that was the case, I'm curious if you have either made accommodations in the work plan or you're at least thinking about those things and, and what you might be able to share with us. Yeah, definitely. I can start off with that, Megan or Nick, if you want to add anything, uh, please join as well. Uh, you know, I think one of the key learnings for, for me personally was we need to have a, a certain amount of flexibility in the work that we're doing. Uh, with the pandemic, with the changes that happen, can't really plan for everything that's going to be happening. And that's why intentionally as a part of the work plan, again, uh, we chose these higher level buckets of work and we wanted to put them on the agenda two or three times uh, so that we can start with just understanding, you know, the, the background level set with the board on, on the current state of some of these issues. Um, and then as a board decide, uh, do we need to dive deeper into one or more of, of these areas um, as, as a situation might develop as well? 
one more follow-up question if I can. Oh, do you want to comment? Sorry, pardon me. Thanks, Councilmember. I just wanted to quickly add to that and just say that I think another important component of what we learned over the last year or two is the importance of bringing, uh, continuing to hear those updates from our community partners and the importance of making those community partner connections with all of our work. Uh, because especially when we're in the midst of a, of a crisis and a public health crisis that absolutely we need to, uh, you know, not only just share all the learnings with one another, but also be there for our community partners and vice versa in terms of all the great work that can and needs to happen during times like this. So I think that was a great learning and one that was exemplified by all the amazing work that the staff at the public health department did during COVID and how we can move forward and learn from that going forward in the future. I certainly agree that um, the concept of the task force model that got stood up very quickly is a model that I think will probably, you know, kind of keep in the back pocket for use in other areas if necessary. Uh, one other quick follow up to um, uh, Council Member Nelson and Carter's uh, um, request on on domestic violence. Um, one of the most uh, difficult things that we know that people who are are um, in those situations, they have to deal with emergency housing. And so when you look at housing and health, I think it's uh, it would be great for you to tie that that work plan together. And if that's an angle you can take to kind of put this on in there, um, uh, you know, I know that um, asking a, a single mother uh, or a, maybe not a single mother, but a mother and small children to leave very, very quickly and, and find a place that they feel safe is very difficult to do. Um, and I don't think that we personally in Bloomington have accommodation for that. That um, And so some recommendations from you on that, I think would be welcome here. Thank you. Thank you. Else, anything additional? If not, thank you. Thank you for your work over the past years and for your, your plans for the future. And please uh, take our thanks back to the entire uh, commission and, and express our thanks for the work that they do and the, the important work that they do in the city of Bloomington. So, thank you, Mayor. Thank, thank you, you, Council. Thank you. Item 5.4 on our agenda is introduction of Pardon new me, employees. Mr. Mayor, yes, Mayor I think we have to make a motion to accept. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I always do that. I always forget. Okay. I always miss those, don't I? We get excited about the conversation. Council Member D'Alessandro. I'd be happy to do that, sir. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to accept the Advisory Board of Health's 2021-2022 annual report and their 2022-2023 work plan as presented. Second. Motion by Council Member D'Alessandro and a second by Council Member Carr to accept the Advisory Board of Health's annual report and work plan as presented. No further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Thank you for the reminder, council member. Appreciate it. And now we will move on to item 5.4, uh, the introduction of new employees. And we have a couple of different groups, uh, actually uh, one from our IT department and then a, a handful from public health. And I believe Amy Cheney, our IT director, is on the screen. I was going to inter introduce for us Jim Malone, our new systems administrator. Good evening, Ms. Chairman. Um, thank, thank you, Mayor Bussey and members of the council. It's my pleasure to introduce our newest IT employee, Jim Malone. Uh, Jim joined the IT department on February 28th, and he is a systems administrator. And he's catching on very quickly, helping to triage technical issues and supporting users. Jim's focus will be on evaluating and administering the city's current technology solutions, as well as assisting in the design and acquisition of new solutions. Jim most recently worked for uh, worked supporting technology for the Excel Energy Center and Minnesota Wild. He is a Sergeant in the United States Marine Corps and a combat veteran from 2001 to 2005 with a takeover of Iraq. He's also a very proud hockey dad. Welcome, Jim, and would you like to say a few words? Uh, yes, thank you, Amy. Um, City Council Mayor, I just would like to say uh, I'm looking forward to working with this uh, city. It seems to be amazing so far in the three weeks that I've been here. And uh, I look to just support and make everybody, uh, everything work for everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Malone, or Sergeant Malone, I guess I should call you. Uh, welcome aboard. Very glad to have you on board, and um, oh, I've been saying to people for the past two years, looking forward to meeting you face to face. But well, we can still say this, but uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to to meet you in City Hall here shortly. So, thanks much. Welcome aboard. 
As I said, we also have five new members in our public health department, and Dr. Nick Kelly is going to give us the introductions of those individuals. Good evening again, Dr. Kelly. Good evening, Mayor, Council members. Uh, one of our new members is uh, new to you, but uh, well known to us. Uh, Colleen Herman Franz uh, just celebrated her two year anniversary with us. She started at a very fortuitous time for us, right before uh, we got really busy, and uh, she has been an amazing asset on the communications end for our team. Uh, she came to us with a, a wealth of experience in the nonprofit and uh, public sector, and it's just been phenomenal uh, to work with as we communicate a lot of different information in the middle of a pandemic. Colleen, you wanna say hi? Hi, Mayor, City Council, and City Manager. Um, I'm resurfacing after the uh, all of the work on the pandemic, and I've enjoyed my two years with the city and looking forward to many more. Thank you. Well, thank you, and uh, I would say welcome, but if you've been here for two years, I guess welcome back, and uh, uh, <laughs> thanks for your work during the pandemic. I know what an incredibly heavy lift that was, and I appreciate uh, the work that you and all the members of the public health did, so thank you much. We, uh, Kyler Dennigan is a, a new member of our team. We were able to bring on some additional staff to help do some additional COVID work. Uh, so Kyler comes to us with 10 years of freelance experience and a wide variety of communication skills, and he's gonna be spending time with us helping uh, us plan for the future and do communication on that end. Hi, Mayor, City Council members, and City Manager. Uh, happy to be here working with Colleen and look forward to addressing public health concerns in Bloomington. Well, good evening, welcome. Glad to have you on board. Olga Quintanilla is one of our new community health workers. So she is gonna be spending a lot of time with some of our city colleagues in police and fire, really helping build some of those bridges and connections to uh, try and minimize the frequent flyers we might see and our, our services on that end and try and do prevention to prevent uh, the frequency of uh, their calls for emergency service. Hi, Major and City Council and City Manager. Um, I've been living in Bloomington for 10 years and I am very excited to be working in public health and looking forward to, to many more. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, looking forward to meeting you and glad to have you with our public health department. Uh, Laura Ernst is one of our public health nurses. So she came to us with a, about a little over a decade of experience in pediatrics in, in uh, the healthcare world. She's now part of our WIC and disease prevention and control team. Uh, jumped right in serving families here in our community. Uh, Mr. Mayor, Council members, we're having a slight technical difficulty, so we're not able to hear Laura's audio, but I'm sure she would say that she loves working with Dr. Kelly and the rest of the public health staff. I apologize, not able to get her on screen and on audio. Good job pinch hitting there, Mr. Sable. Good job. Uh, I'm sure that's, a, that's about what she was going to say. So in, in the audience tonight, uh, we have Fanny uh, Yimbo Limba. She is one of our community health workers and working uh, a lot in our uh, multi-unit housing. So she's part of, a, we have some funding from MDH to do some targeted work in our community. And uh, Fanny is part of that team doing that work. Get this lower. Good evening, Mayor and City Council members. I am Fanny Jimboliapa. I'm a community health worker in the Public Health Division. Excited to be here. I'm a Bloomington resident. I do speak Spanish, so that has been very key important work that we do connecting our Spanish-speaking communities and families to the city, serving Richfield, Bloomington, and Edina. So I look forward to doing the work that I do and look forward to having more uh, Spanish-speaking staff and members of the community here in the city. Thank you. Very good. Thanks for being with us tonight. Appreciate you being here. Thank you, Dr. Kelly. Uh, we do this typically because we know that a lot of the, the folks that we introduce either have interactions with the council or, or staff or more importantly with the public. And we just wanna make sure that we have an opportunity to get our new council, our new staff members, get their faces on the screen. So when people see them, they know who they are. They're a little bit of familiarity and know a little bit more about them. And um, 
So we, we've been doing this as we've been getting new employees on board. And um, uh, Jim, Laura, Fanny, Olga, Colleen, and Kyler, welcome aboard. Glad to have you and look forward to, to as I said, meeting you in person when we get the opportunity and look forward to getting you out into the community and helping the residents of Bloomington. Thanks much. Moving on in our agenda, as we did with our uh, agenda, we moved item 8.2 to this position in the agenda, so right before the consent business. So I would like to call uh, item 8.2, which is a discussion on the council rules of procedure amendment that, we, uh, uh, that we've uh, laid out. And what I think I'd like to do is um, probably do a, a staff report, maybe go through what, what the, the plan is, talking about what uh, the outline might be and how we might approach this, then perhaps, as I said, uh, open up it up to public comment and um, try to limit that to, to 20 minutes, give everybody up to three minutes to talk, and, and we can get a bunch of different public comment, and then we'll have the council have their discussion about this as well. So if that sounds like a plan for everybody, I think that's what we'll move forward with. Ms. Manderscheid. Thank you, Mayor members. Uh, at a very high level, there are two... Uh, items being addressed for your consideration tonight. The first is related to the ADA, Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, when we were working on the rules um, in the past, I had been in communication with the city's ADA coordinator and uh, she had in indicated an interest in doing a deeper dive and we had communicated that the next time we looked at amending the rules, we would incorporate her comments and so those are reflected in the document before, your, for, before you for consideration tonight. The second part it relates to public comment, and we've heard uh, comments in the past during public comment period about people being somewhat frustrated about the delay in receiving formal feedback to their comments, and we appreciate that the format is um, somewhat uh, frustrating for people in that it's a one-way conversation. So the proposal before you tonight is to move public comment into a standalone listening session um, that would happen at the same time approximately, but at a more predictable time for those appearing before the council, and that it would be at six o'clock and um, be for a 20 minute time period, similar to how we have public comment period now. And we would allot for uh, an equal, or the proposal would be that we would um, bring back to you if you are decide to pursue these rules, uh, come back to you next Monday, uh, something along the lines of, although very much open to your uh, ideas and those of the public obviously as well. Uh, but, you know, an, an equal amount of time based on those present. And then we would have staff there as well so that people could get, uh, people that were uh, participating in person um, could get um, more immediate connections to the staff and get their um, conversation started and not have to have a delay. Um, the other thing that um, the staff have had in mind uh, in looking at these is that this particular format can be quite intimidating for members of the public to participate. Uh, you have to walk up in front of everybody, you're on microphone, it's uh, televised, and um, it can discourage people. Now, none of this is in, in any way uh, going to impact the other ways that we already accept formal comment, which is, and has always been, by email and telephone, and you see those um, added to your packet before each meeting. So all of that stays, but we're simply making um, a proposal for another format that we feel is, is likely more welcoming and, and more satisfactory uh, to those participating. So Ms. Mandershad, one of the things I noticed in, in the packet, in the description of it, it, it said something about on certain Mondays we would be doing this. And, and I guess it was my impression and, and my expectation that we would do this at, at every regularly scheduled council meeting. Is that the case? Is that your interpretation as well? Uh, so, Mayor members, again, open up, open to your feedback on this. Um, for those of you that um, don't look at it and carry it around in a yellow folder like I do, um, there is a, uh, a, a calendar that we adopt as a council at the beginning of the year and then periodically amend it. And those, uh, and that calendar speaks to all of the regularly scheduled meetings. As a reminder, um, under Minnesota state law, there are three types of meetings, regular meetings, special meetings, and emergency meetings. So we have those uh, regular meetings on this calendar. I think that the general feeling is that we would have these listening sessions before each of the meetings that have an R on them um, so that people would be coming around the same time um, to the same building, you know, and that sort of thing. Um, 
So that would be an easier way for them to know when those meetings are. If there's a council meeting, there's going to be a listening session. And then we would move the council meeting start time back accordingly to 630. And Mr. Verbrugge? Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council members. The you know the language that was in the packet about certain Mondays was just a little bit clumsy because we don't have a defined meeting day per se that, that we follow. It's not like we have first and third Mondays are council meetings. Um, so that's why with the when we come back, if the council decides to proceed, when we come back with the guidelines, we'll make sure that that's clarified so it is connected to each of the regular meetings if that's what council wants to do. Council, questions from... Of Mr. Ms. Vandershine or Mr. Verbrugge? Councilmember Coulter. Well, sorry, Mayor, just a quick clarification of process. Is is the, I mean, I have several questions, and as I'm sure other council members do, is the intent that we ask those questions now or that we, we take in the public comment and then ask questions of, as a part of the discussion after that? I, I think, uh, like the question I asked, the question of clarification, that kind of thing, question of process, I think would make sense about now. But as we get, uh, as I, I would hold off on, on the larger scale questions until after we, we uh, hear input from the public. Okay, I, I do, in that case, I do have a, a few quick questions of, of clarification. Um, one of the things that I, I asked about previously is, um, I'm assuming, of course, that this meeting, as you, as you mentioned, would be covered by open meeting law. And um, I think it'd be helpful for all of us and, and the community to get a better sense of what, what does that entail? What, what kind of records are kept? What um, accessibility accommodations need to be made and, and so on? If you could just explain that briefly, I think that would be helpful. Uh, Mayor members, absolutely. The the meeting, the listening session, um, to create that term for purposes of our discussion, uh, would be covered by the open meeting law, um, which again would mean that it would. I would recommend that it be a regular meeting of the council, um, in that we would adopt us a, a calendar of it, of it um, that would be easy for the public to follow, and um, we would have uh, to have a quorum. Um, which is a basic requirement, so at least um, a quorum of the council would need to be there. And we would have minutes that would be taken because it's a regular meeting of the council. It's, there's a quorum there. So the minutes would be so-and-so was present. Um, you know, it would be the staff in the council. And then if there was anyone from the public that appeared, their names would be listed. And then if there were any actions taken, like to adjourn, that would be listed on the minutes. Um, in, uh, in consultation with the city clerk um, in preparation for this discussion and uh, looking to other cities that have a listening session type approach, that is also the model that they have adopted. Um, so just a, a brief follow-up on, follow on, on that particular point. My understanding, and, and it certainly could be flawed, was that open meeting law would also require these meetings to be recorded in some fashion. Is, am I, is that understanding correct, or w would this need, meeting need to be recorded in some fashion outside of the minutes? You mentioned? Uh, Mayor, members, that would be a decision that you can make uh, in consultation with um, another city that has a listening session. I believe that they, they do not record it. Um, yeah, your council rules talk about, the that apply to this council meeting here tonight, um, talk about the preparation of the, the record, um, specifically that, that there will be a... Um, that it'll be held in person as well as electronically. And so in that way, these the council rules that are being amended tonight, they completely remove public comment from the agenda and the rules. So my suggestion and proposal would be that if you decide to adopt these changes being proposed tonight, that I come back to you next Monday and we lay out the specifics of how you want to practically speaking, kind of manage these details. Uh, so if you tell us tonight that you want it recorded, then we'll put, we'll draft that. If you tell us that you would prefer it not be recorded, you know, or you prefer, you know, some other format. Um, if you pr tell us that you want it to be, you know, however, um, you know, this, this is um, a way of making the public comment more welcoming, more approachable, more satisfactory. And so we're lo looking to you all to give us some guidance on how you want that to be handled. Thank you. That that's helpful. I guess I my recollection back when we had separate study sessions was that they were they were audio recorded, and I guess I assumed that was that was a, a provision of open meeting law. Um, and so then, just a, sorry, a few just other quick mm -hmm. questions. Is 
I mean, this this would be essentially a creation of a a, a new meeting, a separate meeting. Um, is the is and maybe this is a question for us. Um, is the thought or intent that this would be incorporated into our rules of procedure so that the the details and so on would be there would exist, exist that written record of the decisions we make with regards to how this meeting is conducted. Uh, Mayor members, I think it would be a little bit more manageable for the public if we had a standalone document. One of the things that we talked about, if you, for those of you that are digging back into the d way deep vault, um, when we were putting together these rules of procedure, um, was that we came up with a, an item at the very end, which was a more of a user-friendly handout. Uh, and the, the long-term sort of next step was going to be that we would post something in the chambers um, once we... Um, had them set and then we went remote. And so we didn't do that. Um, but I, I think it would be um, something that we would recommend that during those listening sessions that the room that it was in would have these posted information um, so that even if somebody, you know, doesn't carry around a copy of the rules like I do um, and, um, you know, doesn't maybe you know, um, know to look at the back of the room where there's always going to be a copy of the agenda and whatnot that um, they would see them posted and other government bodies do that as well so okay maybe I, maybe i should have asked that question slightly differently so i mean the intent is that some i mean some sort of detail is incorporated into the rules of procedure in in maybe in the way that like that that the appendix and so on but that there is some documentation of, of how those meetings would be conducted uh, mayor members i don't know that i would recommend amending these formal rules um, of procedure that we've that we've been working on uh, I think a standalone document would be easier for the public to manage okay. you know a one page kind of thing that yeah that I guess that's that that's overall the point and then sorry just one last sort of nitpicky question so if, if we were to adopt this resolution tonight it would it would take effect tomorrow according to the according to the date of the resolution so we have a meeting next Monday and there would be no public comment on that Monday because the the details and so on would come back, you said April 11th. Mr. Berugi? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, our um, recommendation was that we would actually implement the, the public comment meeting starting on April 11th mm -hmm. and uh, with the plan to continue under the current agenda format for next week's meeting because it will take us a couple weeks to reformat the agenda and our um, agenda uh, user system, um, so we weren't intending to make the switch for next week. Okay, so there there would still the correct despite the resolution taking if it were to uh, pass. Re it would take yeah, the resolution a would if you do it is approved tonight, but the effective date would essentially be April 11th. Okay, okay, thank you. I that. <laughs> Councilmember D'Alessandro. Uh, thank you. Um, just wanted to be clear on. Um, the ADA portion of this because there uh, were some open questions about uh, about I see on page 17 you have a new paragraph around accommodations is that the only place in which you're making an adjustment to to accommodate that's not a good word accommodate via the accommodation section of the accommodating I don't know how to say that right <laughs> um, but is is that the only place where you're making changes uh, re related to the conversation you had with the uh, ADA coordinator uh, Mayor members, uh, on page six, uh, um, also 154 of the packet, there is language. And then there's also language at the very end of the document, um, the, the handout, the attachment um, that I'm trying to get to the page here. 159, uh, 164. Oh, it was republished, so I have the wrong dates. A wrong, um, so uh, there's an attachment to the rules at the end, the handout, the user-friendly handout. It, there's also amendments on that document. So a couple of things that, that go on with regard to accommodations. We always want the public to request accommodations when they need them. Um, we prefer to get those requests uh, by Friday so that we can, preferably Thursday, but the packet typically comes out on Thursday, because depending upon what the, the request is, we need to... Um, communicate with that requester so that we can identify specifically what they need and then we also need to then take the next step to f locate and or identify the assistance the accommodation so for example if they need a translator um, a signed translator we need to find a signed translator um, and we have a, a contract set up to get those resources but it's a matter of scheduling and again it's a night meeting and so we need to um, 
work, you know, very quickly to try and get that done. Councilmember Nelson. Thank you, Mayor. A couple of quick questions of clarification. So um, I understand from the proposal that public comment will be taken off of the regular agenda, but public comment will still exist. People will have the opportunity to come in, share concerns with the council, and we will have the opportunity to hear from the public. But what we're looking at is maybe a more informal process. And I guess my question on that is, will it allow for back and forth between council and community so that we can have those questions? And, and sometimes, you know, candidly, as you may have noticed, I sometimes don't know where the line is exactly there. I'm trying to get more information from people and understand the issue and clarify it. And, and that's been a challenge that I've had. So will there be that opportunity for back and forth, I guess, in this new format mm -hmm. if we went forward? Uh, Council Member, my, my intention all along was to do just that, to make it a much more conversational uh, interaction between the Council and people bringing items forward. Uh, I think it's, it, has, it has always felt uncomfortable. Ten years of doing it, sitting up here stone-faced while people talk to us for up to five minutes, uh, and having questions, wanting to do the back and forth, and just not doing that. It just seems an unnatural way of, of having engagement with, 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 uh, with members of the, of the public. And so... That's my intention. Uh, I, I guess how, again, uh, as Mr. Verbrugge said, we'll put all of the, the meat on the bones, how we're actually going to do this. I mean, that's, that's exactly what I was, was proposing and was, was expecting as we go forward, just in the same way I was expecting we would do this at every council meeting. Okay. Um, and then there was a mention of in-person and technological. Would that mean that we're considering allowing people to call in, connect via WebEx or something like that? Because I know this 6 o'clock time frame is somewhat inconvenient for some people in our community. Same deal with the, the eye on trying to make this more engaging, engaging or have better engagement with the folks who want to connect with us. Yes, I think we've seen over the past two years that uh, call-ins can be used pretty effectively. Yeah. I and mean, we had it tonight. We had people here. Exactly. We had someone call in. Exactly. I mean, yeah. whatever works. Absolutely would be my intention. Okay. And then the only concern I would have, oh, not the only concern, but one of the concerns I'd have is the 20 minutes. That is our current time frame for public comment. With the back and forth, is there any consideration about um, changing that 20 minutes? Because I just I worry that it's going to go a little bit longer with a back and forth. Mr. Verbrugge? Uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, maybe that's a detail we get into when yeah. we, we start going a little bit more in depth. Uh, what we do want to do is make sure that we maintain, uh, you know, a standard of equal time. If we, if we know that we have five people that are going to be there, that we set four minutes a person. If we know there's going to be two people, that it's 10 minutes, whatever it is, right? And so I, I appreciate that concern about the 20 minutes. Um, the In this format, the council has had the ability to extend if they wish. Uh, it, in that, in the proposed format, uh, a little less flexibility. So one of the things the council may want to discuss is whether the proposed times are right. You, know, you could also, um, a lot more time, frankly, and say, say 6 o'clock for the listening session and 7 o'clock for the regular meetings or 5.45 and 6.30. So I think you have options available. Okay. And then one last question on that. So it would be up to us as, as a body to determine if it's recorded, how that's shared and things like that. So um, there would still be an opportunity for people to hear those comments and, and that if that's the direction we want to go, which would frankly be my preference, but we'll get into that conversation later. Um, so I just want to make sure, because I think that's one of the biggest concerns I've heard is just making sure people understand what has been talked about what issues are being brought forward by the public and uh, making sure that people have that information. And I know, Mayor, you've talked about reporting out, but maybe there's a, an additional step there. People can, if they're interested, uh, go uh, listen to it or watch it, so. Councilmember Coulter. Sorry, Mayor, my notes were a little more stream of consciousness than usual, and I neglected just two last quick questions here. Um, I Just to clarify, and I think this was already spoken to, this would affect, this change would affect solely the the city council created public comment period that currently exists at the beginning of our council meetings, correct? It does not affect public hearings, many of which my understanding are, are required by law. Ms. Mandershan. M Mayor and members, that is correct. It is only public comment period. It's the item, was it 4.2 on the agenda? That is it. 
uh, it, the public hearings are totally different, and um, many of those are required by statute. <clears throat> Sometimes we call them public comment because the statute will call them public comment um, uh, and or um, some other regulation. And so those are completely separate from that, and uh, the rules of procedure have always treated them separately. Thank you. And, and just to sort of uh, expand on that a little bit, could you detail just briefly some of, some of the kinds of things that do require public hearing so folks know what what will still happen in the regular what would still happen excuse me in the regular council meeting uh, that folks would have the opportunity to participate in uh, mayor members la uh, many land use applications require a public comment period or excuse me a I made the mistake. <laughs> a public hearing. Uh, there are, you know, tonight we have a redistricting that we're looking at. Uh, all kinds of things in state law require uh, a public hearing, um, per se. And again, um, you know, oftentimes um, people think of it as, you know, everybody gets to be heard. It's the opportunity to be heard. And so oftentimes, you know, we'll be in these meetings and there won't be anybody who wants to participate. We still have to do that public hearing. And the state law also requires certain types of notices in advance. So, for example, we publish it in the newspaper. It's on our city website. You go to our city website slash notices. All of that information is there along with the documents that are being considered at that public hearing. So 10 days in advance, it's on our city website well in advance of the public hearing and um, and then again appears in the packet and whatnot so it's very different thank you thank you that's a helpful clarification and and my last question and i promise this really is my last question um you know as as i sort of alluded to previously the the public comment period we're discussing is is a creation of our own rules of procedure there is no requirement for public boards city council school boards etc to have an open public comment period such as this. Am I correct? Mayor, Mayor and members, you are correct. Thank you. And that really is my last question. <coughs> Council members, any other questions? I don't see hands going up. So uh, I would like to open this up to our public comment about public comment, if we could. Uh, Mr. Brillert, uh, you're going to be on the shot clock here. We're going to be at uh, three minutes per person. We'll. Like I said, we'll try and get through everybody. I uh, would like to limit it to 20 minutes because we do have other folk, other things that we've uh, on, on the agenda that uh, we're, we're adding this on, so we want to make sure we get to those as well. So uh, I'll, I'll open it up. What I'm going to ask you to do is come up and uh, state your name. Uh, I think we have room on the sign-in sheet there as well. If you could sign in either before or after you speak and uh, uh, provide your public comments on public comment. <laughs> I saw people wearing shirts and signs. I thought they were going to come talk. Rick Oliva, uh, thanks for doing this. Um, it's an interesting proposal that, I, that I'm hearing. I heard that the school board is doing something similar. I talked to one member that said, yeah, but nobody shows up. So that's actually they're getting less feedback from the public. I don't know if that's true. That was one, one person's comment. I, I've been asked by a couple people. I've had a couple conversations uh, with council members about this. They said, do you feel that coming and speaking this way in a public comment period is really helpful? And my answer was, I felt like emails were very easy to be ignored or blown off and that I would get responses, not always, um, but not always and not from, always from everybody. And coming here, even if you weren't paying attention, you had to hear what I was saying. And I feel like I did get responses from people, I got more action, more response by doing it this. Excuse me, by doing it this way. Also, I think it's going to be hard. I, for, I think it was uh, Councilmember Nelson. You said, I think it's going to be really hard if there's more than one person that wants to have a uh, conversation with you to keep it under 20 minutes, because um, I could talk for a half hour. Um, a couple of things I know uh, when I was on the school board. So that week uh, in, in, in between, like if, if we actually have a question to come in and ask it, you don't always know the answer. So you might have an opinion, but you won't have an answer. And, so, and sometimes your opinion is misinformed or not fully formed. And so having that week to come up with a thoughtful response or get the correct resources to say, well, this is what I think it is, but I'm going to actually get to get to that answer. To be able to respond in a week or if the next meeting is two weeks later, for me personally, it hasn't been... Um, I haven't felt like that was that long. Now, if it was six months, I might be like, well, come on. I asked you this question six months. Um, so 
Maybe you consider, if you do go down this road, I'd ask maybe you say, hey, and we did this when I was on school board, we're going to do this in six months, we're going to revisit and vote on it again, or in a year, we're going to revisit, we're going to vote on it again. Um, you might consider, like, this is great to have a conversation, but like we said, it's going to be hard to do it in 20 minutes. Maybe instead of that, you keep the public comment or the, uh, and, and, and you have one meeting a quarter that's dedicated to just having these conversations. Um, also, some clarification would be, if, is this is the intention that I come in and I speak to my representative from my district, or would it be a conversation with everybody? And if it is a conversation with everybody, I think you're going to have a hard time uh, keeping it in 20 minutes. So I'll leave 19 minutes for someone else. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Oliva. Angela Coya. Do you want me to sign in now or later? Uh, you can, why don't you sign in after you're done? Okay. That's fine. So I do like the format of the Patrick. I've emailed all of you, I'm sure, except for Lana. I don't have your email, sorry. Um, I like the casual setting. I don't like this, so I agree this is really intimidating for people that don't feel comfortable speaking. Um, to keep it, to Rick's point, to keep it on track, maybe allowing people to bring their issues forward and telling them you have five minutes if you need time to rebuttal because I realize you guys can't remember every little detail it's understandable to say I'm gonna have to look into this can I get back to you in a week or so um, I don't really like not having it televised I feel um, even though I don't like being up here it shows transparency from you guys if it is televised I mean I have a lot of re residents or neighbors that don't come to this because of their life businesses and um, et cetera, but they watch the meetings. I've heard comments say, hey, I liked your comment, or I heard Rick, whatever. I get a lot of feedback in my neighborhood, and I do like the transparency of being on video, even though I don't like being on video. <laughs> but, <laughs> but thank you for those that did respond. I know that you all have jobs, and I do appreciate the response. Um, and it is nice to get clarification because of either miscommunications on social media or rumors or whatever. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Frost. Good evening, council members. This is an excellent example of why we have public face-to-face -face hearings. Because I heard about this very late, and all I heard was that we're going to get rid of public comment. You know, it was the nature of rapid information. That's all I knew. So I came here with an expectation that's very different than what I'm hearing. I think the proposal now is going to improve things considerably, particularly getting rid of the artificial, you sit there stone-faced, as Tim said, and, you know, don't say anything. Uh, it's frustrating. And a lot of times, a one-minute response from a council member can settle the issue there. A lot of times, as the previous speaker just said, it's going to take an, I don't know, but I'll get back to you. And that's perfectly acceptable. You know, we all have businesses and lives do. We don't think that somehow because you've got, you know, Matt and, and, and all the others, and, and Christine and all the other staff you've got, that you have it all right in front of you. But this format, I think, ahead of time, more than 20 minutes probably, uh, is, is a very good idea, and uh, it allows... The important part of interaction with you is something I learned when I first did my first trial. There's a reason why they want the jury to see the witnesses, because you can read people's faces and you can get a sense of, you know, are they lying to you? Are they really behind this? You can't get that by email. That's not replicatable on email. And that's very important, both ways, because a lot of times you look at them and you, oh, I know, I'm really convinced that Lone is telling me the truth here. This is what's going on. It's not just all negative. I would suggest that you do have it recorded for the reason previously stated that it's transparent, for the reason previously stated that people who aren't here can see it, but also because just knowing we can all go back to it lets you check what was really said, lets us check what was really said. Because I know as I get older, my memory is not as perfect as it once was. And if I go back and find out what Council Member Carter said or, or, or what the mayor said, I can check what happened and say, this is, this is good information. I think that's a really good idea. And it's not that expensive. So thank you for doing this, and I think this is an excellent example of why we should continue to do it. I, th I now think the new format's a really good idea, with some changes I mentioned. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Frost. Uh, I already signed in. Uh, Andy Thule here. Um, <clears throat> I just want to say, you know, the, the devil's always in the details on this, but uh, what the other previous speakers said about the public recording, I think that's very, very important. I'm going to give you a little story about, um, I spoke in the school board about 
about a month ago, actually my daughter and I both spoke um, in school board and they have a listening session. Um, you pre-register, you know, for this listening session so that people know that you're going to be there, which is a good idea. Um, and the school board greeted us before we came in and all that, which was really nice to get to know the people on the school board and whatnot. So it was a real informal, decent process. I like that process. But one thing that happened, um, I asked during the during the listening session for the school board members to follow up with me and and they it was two weeks later nobody followed up with me regarding contacting parents regarding a concern of why they left the district and nobody contacted me so I sent out another letter to them and it, the title of it was disappointed because nobody contacted me so then they were supposed to reach out to the parents. A month goes by, the parents weren't contacted about why they left the district, right? So in a, in a private meeting, I met with them again, and, and they said that they didn't take any minutes, right? So really, this leaves a lot of blue water, right? So if you guys do a good job with this, you take very accurate minutes, right? Because it's up to who the minute taker is, right? And being that nobody took minutes, nobody publicly recorded the meeting, right? There was really no record of it other than a resident actually there taking video of myself and my daughter speaking, if that makes sense. So I want to know, will you guys allow, um, obviously, will you allow others to come in and record it if you're not going to record it? Could you guys respond to that? Is that in the rules or are you guys going to? Can, I think, as you said, Mr. Thule, the devil's in the details there. The devil's in the details. We haven't, I, I, I hope we've... you don't pass the details tonight until we know the details. Yeah, if if I, you pass something tonight, we don't have the details. How can we accurately? I'm just giving you guys a, a true story about what happened is basically these parents still haven't been followed up on because the minutes weren't there. It wasn't publicly recorded, right? If, if we didn't, and, if we stopped somebody from publicly recording it, I, I guarantee Mr. Frost would uh, be all over it. I, that's I, the I first <laughs> amendment thing that yeah. we we're talking about again. So, but I, I haven't, I haven't been speaking that long in public comment, but Mr. Mayor, the, 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 the public comment is a place for us to express for it's, it's a live stream thing. I'm on video right now. Right. But, what would be really nice is you don't always have to stand around stone-faced. You could say, after I speak on carts, you could say, Mr. Thule, I tell you what, we're going to have a staff member follow up with you following this meeting, right? If you had a staff member follow up with me and the cart thing was resolved and it came to the next thing, I wouldn't have to wait six months. Does that kind of make sense? No, I'm just trying to drive the point home. Mm -hmm. The devil's in the details. So thank you. Thank you. My first thing I want to say is, even though a lot of us don't see eye to eye on yeah, almost... Just, if I can interrupt for oh, one oh, second. Oh, I'm so, sorry. If you could tell us your name, please. Oh, yes. My it. name is Tom. I've been a resident of Bloomington almost my whole life. And Tom, your last name, please. We, well, just for the record. W-I-L-L-E-T-T. -T. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I do want to say that I do have love for each and every one of you, even though we don't see eye to eye and everything. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to come up here, but also to state that on the way over here, I was praying, and one thing that God brought to my brought to mind was, the Bible says, to be quick to listen and slow to speak, and that's something I have to work on myself. But Mayor Busi earlier tonight said that, you know, it's, it's good to, he wants to listen to people, and so, you know, listening does marvelous things when you really stop and you just take in what someone's saying, even if you don't agree with them, it does do marvelous things. And that's one reason why I'm in favor of keeping the public, the public comment. That is all. Thank you. Sure. Others? I suspect if you didn't allow filming that Ms. Mandrashid would probably say something before I uh, Yes. <laughs> she... you, you can come forward and speak if you'd like while, while they're signing in if you'd like. We can get them out of the way. There we go. Yeah, please. Okay. My name is Colleen Bloom, and I have lived in Bloomington just about my entire life. I'm not going to say how long that is because it's um, making me just about petrified or um, <laughs> older than dirt, as my sons would say. But I am not in favor of getting rid of the um, public, um, public comment part. Um, 
I really feel that public comment allows residents to hear the vo viewpoint of others, especially when it's done here in this chamber and it's live while the council is going, while the proceedings are going on. It gives others a chance to consider more than one side of the issue. Um, in the last few years, it seems like it's been a lot of one side. We may come up and say something, but I've actually watched, especially when it was a previous mayor who actually ridiculed me after I got done speaking, and that's not appropriate. But we need to be open, we need to be transparent, and our residents need to hear both sides of, of, a, of a question. The public comment is basically a form of checks and balance. It's an accountability of the council to the citizens that it represents. Um, the council sets its own rules. So is there any reason why we can't make the public comment just a little bit more con conversational at the beginning? Why do we need to create a whole nother meeting to basically solve a problem? Basically, we're creating a solution for a problem that really doesn't exist. Um, we can make this a little bit more conversational at the beginning. Maybe it's the only part of the meeting that's a little less formal, but we're not creating an entirely new meeting to do it. For the people that are a little intimidated, I'm one of them. It's like for me to get up here takes a lot, but I'm willing to speak my piece. And there are other provisions. We can send emails. We can send text messages. We can send, send snail mail. Um, but transparency, transparency is essential. And removing public comment hinders that transparency. Um, keeping the public comment, it's not about having an open mic. It's not about people coming up and saying things just because we can be heard by the community. It's not about being given a platform for five minutes of fame, and it's not about using it for um, publicity, free publicity. But it is about addressing the, res the concerns that we have as residents, concerns that affect each and every resident in the city of Bloomington. And to take the public comment away from this forum, granted, it's like have a listening session, then the comments are paraphrased. It benefits the citizens to hear what is being said, when it's being said, in real time, without a paraphrase or a spin being put on it. So I do not agree with public comment being taken out. I really believe that if we want to keep full transparency, we need to keep the public comment in this room during the council meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak? Hi, Kelly Kessler, Bloomington resident for almost 47 years. Um, as someone that's intimidated to speak in public, I understand the camera can make someone nervous, but I think putting myself in a room with just people there that are going to go back and forth, it kind of scares me more because just sitting here watching some of these public comments over the years, even though you're not supposed to go back and forth, there have been times where the mayor has made a comment that's kind of derogatory or condescending, and to think that if I bring a topic up that's not welcomed, I'm going to have to sit there and be degraded back and forth, and I don't think that's going to help people with their intimidation, so I think you really need to think that it's more than just a camera that makes someone nervous. It's the way they're just out there to get their comment out there, maybe not even be talked about, just heard. And I don't think the situation in a private room where it's not recorded and no one knows what was actually said is the way to do it. So thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Again. Hello again. Um, yeah. Well, after listening to you tonight, it seems to me like you just want to kick the can down the road. Now, we all voted you into office. We um, expected you to want to hear from us, and I just don't think it's right that you don't want to keep up with the public comment. I just think that something is drastically wrong with this picture if you guys want to shut the door on us, and it's not right. It's wrong. Anyone else? Well, I appreciate the timing. Oh, go, go ahead. You're, we'll, we'll, one last, because I was just going to say I appreciate the timing, because we're right at that 20 minutes, and then we'll... 
get into the council discussion on this. Hello, my name is Rafael Bustos, and I've been a resident of Bloomington for 24 years. Um, I think it's a great, great city, and I really appreciate being here earlier tonight and seeing the police force here. That was, I'm a big advocate of the police, and I think, I think we do have the best police department in the state. And I really appreciate you guys here, too, because uh, you certainly fulfill a, a huge purpose. Um, and I know that this, uh, this open forum that we have as residents of Bloomington is not, uh, privy to every city. And I appreciate Melissa, what you said, how this is, this is kind of special for us to be able to do this. So I really, I think transparency, it, transparency is huge. Uh, devil is in the details and I agree with, uh, the fact that this is live streamed, correct? This is broadcast on Bloomington Access Cable, and I think we're also Facebook Live, are we not? Or we're YouTube. YouTube, excuse me, YouTube Live. Yes. And so, if we change the format, we won't be live streamed, will we? That's part of the discussion. Correct. Okay. Um, I think it's important that we are because I don't know how many people are sitting at home in the comfort of their couch watching this, but uh, I, I think there's a lot of power in that. So. Uh, to let the voice of uh, the residents be heard. And I uh, appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. All right, one last call, folks. Can I just make a comment? One. One, one, give I, it. I just had someone say that was a good point that I brought up, just because they're watching live. All right. <laughs> Thank you, <Kyle. laughs> All right, with that, I will close our public comment period on uh, item 8.2 tonight. Uh, oh, no, she missed it. She missed it. She missed what? Natalie, sure, come on forward, Natalie. That's fine. <laughs> Thank you. I had not planned on speaking because I am one of those two who would rather not be up here. Um, first time I spoke here, was to save um, Valley View Park. And um, I have since seen things happen by the council that don't reflect what a number of the residents feel. I've met a number of these people. They come here to speak because they care. Just because some of us are nervous or it's uncomfortable doesn't mean we get rid of it. I love the idea that you want other opportunities or other avenues for people to use to speak. I think that's great. Um, I will say that people are not always stone-faced. I have had eye rolls when I've spoken. I've had um, been addressed at following meetings when I wasn't even here. So it's not always stone-faced. But I think it is worth keeping in our meetings because I think what we have to say is important even if we're nervous. So thank you for letting us speak. <laughs> thank you. Okay, now final, final call. <laughs> yes. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for your input. We will close the public comment on item 8.2. Thank you for that. Council. Um, we, we've talked about this, and, and I think the, um, we've heard you know, the, the notion the devil's in the details, and, and uh, that is a very good point. I think uh, I had at least copied you or at least sent information to you. The, 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 um, the packet report I don't think really encapsulated what we were looking at here, and I'm glad we had this conversation and asked all the questions that we did, and I think it makes a lot more sense now uh, what, we are, what we are considering or at least conceptually what I think would work best in terms of what we would look at. And um, that would be, uh, we would have this at every meeting. We would set it at at least 20 minutes, I guess. I mean, the conversation has, uh, has brought forward some different ideas there that uh, it would be more informal and more of a, an, an opportunity for one-to-one -one engagement with residents, that there would be some sort of reporting out or recording. I mean, all the different concepts of, uh, of uh, what we do here, uh, just in a more informal setting where, uh, again, it's, it doesn't feel as intimidating and unwelcoming and I and I appreciate the people who who uh, you know buck up and actually do come up here even though they're uncomfortable doing it but I know there's a lot of people who don't 
I absolutely know there's a lot of people who don't. And I'm just looking for a way that we could that we could possibly improve on this. You know, a lot of folks, uh, a lot of folks talked about transparency, and obviously transparency is important. And obviously we uh, put that as part of one of our, our our pillars. The second part of that pillar is engagement, transparency and engagement. And I think from an engagement standpoint, this format of public comment period is just is falling short. It's not the engagement opportunity that that it could be. And I think there are ways, the ways that we've talked about could improve it as an engagement opportunity. Uh, I, I actually went back and did, I looked at two years of public comment period participation. I went through the, the, the minutes and the, re, just reviewed it and tracked um, the 60 meetings, literally the 60 meetings from March 20th, 2020 till, till now. There were 60 meetings. It's about two years almost to the day. And I know it, it was a bit different because of the pandemic. Uh, but once we got our feet on underneath us, I think we did fairly well with the, the call in. I also think it was easier to be part of public comment than it ever has been because people could call in. And um, so as I looked at, as I looked at the, the numbers, so since March 20th of 2020, and I, here's, how, here's how bad I am, here's how anal I am, we, we've had 183 interactions as part of public comment period, 183 interactions. And that includes here in the chambers, over the phone, uh, early in the pandemic, if you remember, we were actually reading some emails as well, so I counted that as interactions and so on. And of those 183 interactions, we heard from a total of 73 different people. So 73 different people. And of those 73 people, uh, eight individuals accounted for 86 of the 183 public comment interactions. That's, that's almost half. And that's not good public engagement. That's That's... That's closing people off, or that's not allowing all the community to come forward and speak. And I, and I really do think that's the case. And it's, it's also worth noting that uh, the first part of our public comment period is a report back from what happened last week. And on those 60 meetings, one short of half, 29 times, there was nothing to report on from the previous meeting, which means there were no questions asked, there was no follow-up required, there was no what's going on. It was more... Uh, the the, the previous meetings, public comments were more were, were more of statements or speeches as opposed to actual interaction with the com with the uh, the council. Again, that's not good public engagement. I think we can do better. I really do think we can do better. And uh, we need to iron out the details on this without question. Uh, it's absolutely, as I said, to have my uh, to, to have these listening sessions to be true listening sessions, an opportunity to go back and forth, to set the time so it's consistent. Everybody knows what's, what's going on. Uh, but while we've had this discussion before and the arguments, they, they talked about, I mean, I, I talked about changing it earlier because of the intimidation factor. I mean, it's intimidating to be here because I thought we could do this better and we could look at different ways. And, and I think those, those still exist. But I think just the opportunity to have better interaction, better engagement with our community is there. And... Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I did not know that the school district had gone to something like this. I'm encouraged to hear that. I think that's an interesting concept. I'd like to talk to them and see how it's going. Uh, also like the notion of perhaps putting this in place, revisiting in a year. I mean, we've been doing things like that for the past couple of years. I mean, this is the fact that we, that we moved our study meetings down here, that we combined regular meetings and study meetings. That uh, I mean, we've done a lot in terms of uh, outreach and engagement. We have a department named outreach and engagement now, and they do fantastic work. We put a lot of resources into it, and I think this is just an opportunity to increase that engagement in, in a different way. And frankly, if it doesn't work, we can always go back. We can, we can change it again, but I do think this is something we should look into. So that's my two cents as I've uh, th thought about this. Appreciate the, the comments we've heard here tonight. Appreciate all the emails that we've received. I'm, I'm glad to, to get that feedback. Uh, I, I'd be glad to, to look at ways that we could we, we could find ways to, to make this uh, beneficial to all, you know, extend it to more than 20 minutes. I, I could see that if we got into a conversation, to look at it again in, in a year, to, to look at it in different ways, uh, an audio recording perhaps, so we actually have an audio record, so it's not a matter of how well Matt takes uh, minutes as, as of what we're talking about. So there's a lot of different possibilities how we could do this, but it's an opportunity, I think, to improve things. So, Councilmember Lohman. And then Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I, I appreciate your, uh, especially the way you've laid out 
uh, these interactions. I think that's very informative in terms of, as I know that before we looked at this, and I was very much a supporter of, of this idea. But I, I'm curious to just, um, there's one thing that, that kind of came through all of this that uh, gave me a little bit of pause. Um, uh, certainly, I would like to see more engagement and more folks uh, being involved. But this idea, you know, with the uh, with pre with the press in particular not paying attention as much because of you know the, the dwindling resources that they have, there is a sense um, that's been brought forward this idea of a public check uh, for those folks who have uh, differing points of view and find themselves in the minority uh, of opinions uh, as it relates uh, to the council. And so I'd be curious uh, in terms of how you look at that uh, that particular way of looking at this as we you know consider this particular proposal. Because uh, uh, that's one of the things about this. I'm not sure how long we've had this open forum as long as I've been a kid here. <laughs> I've remembered, you know, stone-faced uh, uh, folks standing before the, the council and no, no comment at all. Um, and so I'm just, that's the one piece where, you know, there may be a couple other things here, but that in particular, and I'd be curious to see what you think of that. Uh, thank you, council member. And I think that that's a good point. I think it, um, so as I, yes, this is this has been happening as long as I've been on the council. I mean, ten years, and and so the eight years that uh, uh, council member Win or excuse me, uh, Mayor Winstead was doing this, and I was sitting right there, and then now the two years that I've been doing it, every every public comment period starts with the public comment period is a twenty minute period set aside for members of the public to bring items <laughs> before the council that are not on the the agenda, and I I think that's an important distinction that this is this is the opportunity for the council to hear from residents and to bring, for residents to bring information and ideas and concerns forward to the city council and talk to the council. And I think what we have seen uh, too often lately is that rather than talking to the council, people are starting to talk past the council and, and talking to the general public, which is, which is a thing to do, but it doesn't really fit in terms of what we set up the public comment period to accomplish, where the residents talk to the, to the members of the council. I also think a lot of what we hear during public comment period is a precursor to what eventually becomes a public hearing down the line. I mean, I think nine times out of 10, it come, becomes a public hearing down the line. Uh, when we have our first discussions, for example, on, uh, on flavored tobacco, for example, we, we had the first discussions on that with the, the formal public hearing a couple of weeks out, and in the interim, we heard from people during public comment about flavored tobacco. Ultimately, we had a public hearing on that, that issue, and I think, as I said, nine, nine out of 10 issues, it probably would fit in that, in that realm, that they're, they're working their way toward a public hearing, we just haven't gotten there yet, and people use public comment to basically bring their ideas forward, whether they're talking to the council or past the council about it, that's what, that's what they're trying to do. So those are my thoughts there. I think uh, I, I appreciate the thought. Uh, I also appreciate that there are many, many avenues, many more avenues than there were even 10 years ago to, to bring ideas forth in the public realm and to bring um, concerns forth in the public realm. I mean, social media has just changed that game completely. And to be able to do that, I think, um, I think in a lot of ways levels the playing field. I think you're right. I mean, with, with media, traditional media declining, I think social media, uh, all the forms of social media levels the play, playing field in that way because you, you don't need to go through the Star Tribune. For that matter, you don't need to come through the council. You can, you can have a Facebook group and, and have it work in that way. So I, I appreciate, appreciate the thought and appreciate the comments on that. Councilmember Carter, and then Councilmember Coulter. I'm sorry, Councilmember Coulter was next, and then Councilmember Carter. You did. I'm sorry, he didn't raise his hand. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, so, first of all, I appreciate you all indulging me. You got a lot of process nerd Nathan tonight, and that I know that's not always <laughs> pleasant for everyone. Um, in sort of the the continuing on in that theme, on, in terms of the process, I I have to begin by saying, frankly, I'm a little bit uncomfortable voting on this resolution tonight as has been said at least five or six times between the two of you, the devil is in the details, and I'm a little bit uncomfortable voting to make this change without knowing exactly what comes next. Um, as, as far as some of those details, yes, I do think there should be an audio recording. I do think it should be, you know, folks can call in just to listen, participate via WebEx, WebEx whatever, you know, whatever sort of 
accessibility options are available. Um, I, I do think we're gonna need more than 20 minutes mm -hmm. for a, a real conversation. And there have been, admittedly not very recently, uh, not very many recently, but there have been times where we've extended the public comment period for longer than 20 minutes. And I, I just, I wanna make sure we're able to, to accommodate folks who show up in that way. Um, those are just sort of some of my initial thoughts on, on the process. Um, I do want to kind of speak to the larger issue, though, because I've been thinking about this idea a lot over the last few days, and, and you know, as we all have, sort of even well before that. And I've heard from a lot of folks about it. Um, and so, you know, again, just to sort of, you know, be clear about some of the things that I asked earlier, we would still have public hearings on ordinances, development plans, licenses, any number of other things. Um, meetings, of course, would still be covered by state open meeting law. I have since learned that it is not a requirement to record them, but um, strongly believe they should be recorded in some fashion. Um, and I, you know, I think another piece that we we have not discussed is that, you know, I've I've heard from a lot of folks on all sides of this issue with regards to to some of the folks, frankly, who have I will use the term abused public comment period in some in some fashion. And and again, this is folks who feel on you know all kinds of different ways about this specific proposal. And the question comes, often comes, well, why can't we just rein in the excesses? Why can't we just address the people, the, the bad apples, so to speak? And as I'm sure our city attorney would say, there's really no way to enforce any kind of regulations on the content of what people say at public comments. We had Mr. Frost step forward at, at the public comment period tonight to discuss something that was on the agenda, and he's a respectful guy, so when the mayor pointed that out, he stepped back and, and we moved forward. There is no way to enforce that kind of behavior. It is, there is, I'm not an attorney, but I'd like to play one on TV. There is case law that folks, what folks say in the public arena un, under, unless it's sort of very specific you know, threats of physical violence and things like that. There is no way to regulate what folks say. And I tried when we talked about our rules of procedure, I tried to convince, I, you know, I tried to say, should we, you know, limit folks questioning or impugning of motives and, and things like that. And, and I was told that very thing. We, all we have, all that it is, all that is in our power to put any kind of guardrails on is time, place, and manner. That's it. And you know, again, I think it's worth pointing out that folks would still have the opportunity to speak with council members, ask questions, raise issues. And that really is the purpose of, of what public comment period is supposed to be. And I, I wanna clarify something, because a couple of folks here tonight spoke to this, um, that some folks don't feel that it is an opportunity to address the community at large. And I clearly that is the case, I will say, I can't speak for others on this dais, but the majority of the emails that I got about this proposal said that folks do feel that this is an opportunity to speak to the broader community, to have their thoughts broadcast to the city of Bloomington. And so I went back and actually read what our council rules of procedure say, because as the, and the mayor sort of referenced this earlier, that uh, public comment period exists for the purpose of providing members of the public with an opportunity to address the city council on any subject pertaining to city business. Public comment period does not exist to turn city councils into an open mic night. If folks feel that there is something important that the community should know about, they can talk to their neighbors. They can write letters to the Sun Current, post on social media, book time on Bloomington Public Access. They can even, as some folks in this room have done, well, every, and everyone up here has done, run for office themselves. There are <laughs> ample opportunities more perhaps than there ever have been before to make thoughts known to the community. I don't believe that is the purpose of city council meetings, to broadcast what anyone wants to say about anything. So, you know, and this has been spoken to before, so I won't, I won't go on too much longer here, but you know, a lot, of the, a lot of what we have heard from folks, a lot of what I have heard from folks, and particularly folks who don't religiously watch council meetings or maybe do so infrequently, they, they've talked to me about how inadequate this current public comment format really is. Um, folks have raised that walking up to a podium and speaking on camera at seven individuals, followed up by a response a week or more later, is really unhelpful and frankly awkward. 
And many of those same folks come expecting exactly what we're proposing, a real conversation. You know, and ultimately I, I did struggle with this on camera versus off camera thing. And I think what for me it came down to is that politicians should be used to doing things on camera. Average citizens who just wanna to talk to their city council members shouldn't have to be. And I, you know, we've, it's been referenced here as well, it's often really difficult to get the full context of someone's comments in this kind of format. And I've heard the concerns about transparency and engagement, our strategic priority. Transparency is not the same thing as giving everyone exactly what they want, when they want, how they want. And as the mayor pointed out, engagement is only valuable if folks get something out of it. And you know, the mayor actually went back and, and pulled the receipts. I, you know, I, I could maybe count on one hand the number of times that folks have really gotten something valuable out of this current public comment format. And, and so, you know, again, to, to sort of paraphrase what the mayor said, I just think we can do better between social media, the pandemic, political strife, and a just generally higher base level of stress. Now, I think more than ever, we need more personal connection. And I think that's especially true with elected leaders. I honestly believe that this, this arrangement, and we do need to work out the details, but this kind of arrangement, having an informal conversation off camera that allows for greater depth, will be better for everyone concerned and will actually result in more meaningful interactions and better outcomes. Councilmember Carter, thank you for your patience. And thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I have a quick question. Uh, well, first I wanna thank everybody who shared your opinions and I really appreciate um, those who brought solutions forward, ideas forward for, um, you know, not necessarily just saying like absolutely not, but really trying to be um, uh, thoughtful about compromise and figuring out what this really will look like and open-minded. So, uh, and, I, and I think that we are all hopefully there too as council members. I know I am trying to be very open-minded about this. And so um, I think that uh, Mr. Oliva had brought up a question around, um, like is, would this be a conversation with everyone or would it be one-on-one -on -one conversations? Like would I be talking to a constituent on my own or would it be more of a group kind of facilitated conversation? I, I saw it as a group facilitated conversation and not just with the seven of us in the room, but uh, I mean the, the idea of pre-registering I think is a good idea and maybe even a topic. So then if we know if it's about traffic circles, we can make sure that Glenn Markergaard is there or that uh, Carl, Carl is there, you know, that type of thing. So we could have appropriate staff in the room as well. Right, right. Uh, and then I assume that you are not meaning that people would have to pre-register. People no, could no. just show up. No, this would be open, yes. open to everybody. Yes. Right, okay. Um, so I do agree with Councilmember Coulter that um, I wouldn't want to vote on anything tonight with having some of those key details ironed out. I do believe that it should be recorded. Um, my preference would be an audio recording. I have had very direct conversations with constituents who have had their faces, you know, screenshotted and blasted all over Facebook groups and their personal appearance made fun of. And I mean, it really does damage in our community when people see that happen. People who have never testified at public comment before, they see that and they're like, oh, heck no, I would never do that. And that's not okay. Um, you know, as you, as you pointed out, it's transparency and engagement, and we have 90,000 people living in this city. Um, it's already an intimidating space. I know when I used to get in front of that podium, I was scared out of my mind. I probably still would be to this day getting up, get up, getting up in front of there. Um, and so I do want some audio record, but I would pr prefer not to have the visual component so that people could feel a little more comfortable, have some of their pri privacy preserved. Um, with the acknowledgement, of course, that you know their name would still be on the public record as participating in the meeting, and their comments or whatever issues or concerns or questions they brought up would still be documented, um, and that that audio file would still be available. Uh, and I do also agree that we will more than likely need twenty more than twenty minutes. Uh, I know that. I mean, whenever people come up and and do public comment, there are so many times that I'm like, gosh, I wish I could just ask them a bunch of follow follow-up conversations. Mr. Oliva and I sat at the coffee shop a couple weekends ago and spoke for almost, what, two hours? And we probably could have kept going. It was a great conversation. Um, and we realized that we probably agreed on 85% of things. Yeah, had to disagree well, to... <laughs> yeah, agree to disagree on the other 15%. So, I mean, it was a great conversation. And now I look forward to the next conversation we have. And 
like the big ideas we agreed on. And it's kind of getting, it gets into the details, the semantics, and, and sometimes it is we just have to agree to disagree. But I think having that opportunity to really have a meaningful conversation with people. And, and I also am absolutely happy to treat it as kind of a pilot phase and see how things are going after a year. And if it isn't working well, um, if people are unhappy, then you know we can go back. So those are my thoughts. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member D'Alessandro and then Council Member Martin. Council Member D'Alessandro. You kind of sort of had your hand up first. No, you sure? Okay. Uh, thanks, Mayor. Um, so if a, a point of personal privilege, I want to just speak to all of you directly. Thank you for being here. Um, nobody doubts that you don't, like nobody doubts that you care about this community, that it's obvious, right? And um, and I think that it's important um, that we we maintain an open mind and an open heart about that um, I also hope that you, by coming here tonight, realize that um, there were a lot of assumptions that people made about what this meeting was going to be about, <laughs> and it's not nearly as bad as you thought it was going to be. And I, and you know, some of the emails that I received were, um, you know, pretty derogatory, but also um, pretty, you know, cancel. You're canceling public comment. It's, you're getting rid of it. No transparency, whatever. And that's never what is our intention. And so, um, what it what it comes down to me, and I'll, I'll say this to you as well, we have to figure out how to trust each other. And if we're not going to trust each other, we're not going to make it as a community. Okay. If you've already decided in the court of public opinion that we're not doing anything for you and that we're not good at our jobs and that we're paid by people who um, you know, don't live in Bloomington and don't care about Bloomington, if you've already decided that, then we are starting from a place we cannot recover from. Likewise, if we all sit here and decide that every person that walks up to that day has, has it out for us, and is only talking for the purposes of running two years from now against us and not interested in actually engaging with us or to make sure that their blog post sounds good on TV or whatever, then we've lost it too. So I would ask all of us, especially this council, if we're gonna try to do this, we have to be willing to kind of reset our expectations. I get this point of per personal privilege because I'm the newest person here and I don't have all the scars that all of you have. And I say that to all of you, right? Um, but it really is important that we decide to do this as a community and that we don't walk into that room with the eye that you're gonna take people's you know, comments out of context and you're gonna use them for personal gain. And you're not going to, you know, um, decide that because this this thing doesn't agree with what we want to get accomplished, that you don't have a right to a response from us, right? We've got to get past some of those things. And so I like this format because I can, uh, candidly, I, I can tell better when you're talking not to me, but for your audience versus when you're talking to me and you're asking me for redress, right? And I can call you out on that. And I can say, you know, we're not having this conversation. If all you wanted to do was yell at me, we can step outside. If you want to ask me to do something for you, I'm here for it. And I want you to bring that to me, right? I, I think that's the point here. That's the point we're trying to get to is that we want you to come with your ideas, with your concerns, with your admonishments, with, with you know, hey, please get those carts off the darn road, right? <laughs> you shouldn't have had to say it for six months. I'm glad you kept doing it, Mr. Thule. I'm glad we're going to do something about it. That is what we're here for. And if we all agree that even though Mr. Thule and all that, and I have sat down and talked for you know an hour and a half ourselves over coffee, I think we're 50-50 on agree, disagree, but that's okay. I'm good with it. If we can get somewhere where he's bringing something to this table and we can find a way to agree to it, um, that's a good thing, and that's a working government and that's a for the people kind of government and that's the kind of government i wanted to be a part of and so um uh i i yes we're not going to solve this tonight and yes i'm for transparency and yes i'm for recording it i would prefer a transcript candidly because i think it's a little bit better for um for folks even braille reading folks uh or us you know um what am i trying to say sight reading folks to use if it's a it's a physical transcript but open to ideas on that uh and uh yeah we're going to need longer than 20 minutes thank you Thank you. Councilmember Martin. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I, apologies, I'm not going to be that inspiring. I, I, think I, I think I saw the flag wave a little bit once we were talking about um, But no, I, I, I absolutely agree 100% with uh, where my colleagues are coming from on this. I, I guess 
I just come at it from the angle of nuts and bolts. Every section of this meeting is built to help this council reach better policy decisions or procedural outcomes, which then inform staff who, who go and carry out that work. And just as it's structured now, I, public comment isn't doing that for me. It, it feels like you're trying to have a conversation at Mall of America where the escalators are going two different directions. <laughs> and it's like, oh, no, no, I want to keep talking about that. But nope, it's too late. we got to follow up down the line. Uh, so yeah, I, I, I do want to see a little bit more clarification around um, uh, what time we're going to be starting this. I, I do think it's going to take a little bit longer, like everybody sounds, to uh, the nature of the recording, obviously, is, is to be worked out. I'm comfortable moving forward with saying this is the concept for public comment we want to start moving on, especially if staff's going to have to start doing some back-end IT work on this. And then, no, this is going to come back with these three more decision points. But again, folks, these are a lot of the issues that have been raised both here tonight and over email. We'll have another week or so to, to circle back with us on and say, okay, now that we're working on A, B, and C, here's what I think of those three. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm excited. I think we're going to do a lot better work and people are going to feel heard uh, and we'll go a long way. Thank you, Council Member. <laughs> Council Member Nelson. <laughs> <laughs> So I can't pass up an opportunity. So um, I actually think tonight is a good example of why this will probably work well. I think we'll have to tweak it over time, but people were heard and people came forward with good ideas and um, frankly, I think made it better. And I think that they understand it better. And there was even in a more limited way a back and forth here tonight. And, um, you know, I'm very happy with the direction we're going. I think for me, it's important that there is some type of recording, transcription, something like that, so that the community and us have a record to go back to and say, this is what actually was talked about. I mean, Mr. Thule talked about, we, we need to have that record. We need to have it available to people. That That is one of the things that I think, but I think we're moving in the right path. And I think having those conversations has been something that I think will be so much better than us just sitting here looking at someone, they say their piece, they go they, you know, off on their way. And so um, I appreciate um, the city manager and mayor, I appreciate you bringing this forward. And I, I really appreciate everyone here that kept an open mind and sort of listened to what this really is and brought concerns, brought problems um, and, and brought solutions to it. So um, I think a big win for the community tonight. Thanks Council Member, Council Member Lohman. Thank you, Mayor, I think we've or quite a bit uh, this evening. Um, one last thing that I'd mention is we, we essentially have a de facto, um, you know, acknowledging, addressing the public, and I, we're, we're trying to, in one sense, kind of correct that. I think that uh, Councilmember Martin has really uh, kind of put it forward, and I think we kind of need some type of direction uh, to, to, to let staff know kind of where we want to go tonight, and I think that that should be what we, we vote on tonight. I, obviously, we don't have all the details and of course the devil's in details and I've got a lot of skepticism around that. But I think we do need to let the, the broader public know that we're gonna make a move here and make a change here. And I, I would be very supportive of trying to get that moving here tonight so at least the public knows that we're, we're gonna make a change here. Um, do we wanna do that now or we got other folks who wanna comment on uh, this? Great or? minds, Council Member. I think uh, we're on the, on the same track here. I think my suggestion would be that um, we, we direct staff to, to work on this. Uh, but we've got to give them something to work on. We've, we've talked about a lot of different comments here. Why don't we, if we could, um, uh, rapid fire ideas, uh, what, what, what you envision on this. I mean, what I've been hearing is um, uh, the notion of uh, making it a trial period, you know, set, set the time, revisit it six months a year or whatever, to make sure that we specify it is, it is every regular council meeting. Uh, we figure out the time, how long we want to do it. And, and are we thinking we started it you know, do we give it 45 minutes? Do we give it an hour? I mean, how, how do we do that? And I think we uh, ask, what, what are thoughts on that? Because I think the agreement is it, it's gonna take longer than 20 minutes. Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I guess I would say maybe doing 45 minutes with 15 minutes between the listening session and the official okay. start. Cause then we can grab a snack. True, that too, <laughs> that true. Uh, I think the notion of, of recording, um, I, I, I would ask the staff to look into transcription there are dollar signs galore associated with transcriptions, so maybe if we, we talk about a recording possibility, an audio recording. That, that I understand. Yes, I uh, appreciate that. Uh, what else did we hear that were, were good possibilities? I think uh, everybody had good possibilities. We heard a number of them as well. I think the recording also comes out there. Yeah. Mr. Nelson? 
reporting out, like you talked about, at least conceptually so that people knew what topics were discussed. Yes. So if they had interest, they could go back to whatever the recording was to get more info. I would agree. A, a brief recording out at, at the meeting after the, the, the listening session. Council Member Coulter? Um, the only thing I would add is accessibility options, call in potentially WebEx, things like that, so the folk, that folks don't have to be physically present in the room. I would agree with that. Let's remember Nelson. Can we ask them? Yes. Did we miss anything? I was going to ask for the same thing, so <laughs> at least a show of hands or something or whatever. Uh, <laughs> signing up in advance. Uh, sign, yep, a pre-registration. Pre option. Option. option to do so, not requirement. What about just holding it in this room, like a round table saying, like, open discussion? I don't know how well it records in this setting. I think site TBD. How about that? TBD. Natalie? Well, I, I think what the plan is, we're, we're shooting ideas to the staff right now. Yeah. We're going to lay this over until next week, and then we're, they'll, they'll put together a... That could be voted on tonight? Th no, I, th I think what will be voted on tonight is conceptually we're moving forward with this. We're going to lay it over and ask staff to put meat on the bones, and we'll vote on that next week or, or the week after when we, when we actually have details and specifics about this. What will you be voting on tonight? To clear that that we're, we want to move in this direction. Oh, we're not voting... We won't be voting on anything. We're directing staff to... <laughs> we're, we're laying this over and directing staff to... Uh, to, to put meat on the bones for us and so until next Monday night. To continue to share feedback. Yep. Thank you. This is going to sound trivial, but if you have the meeting here, I suggest you make a point of saying, council members sit on chairs down here. Yep. Mm -hmm. People being intimidated, some of them just because you're up there. Good point. Okay. Yep. It, the, only, the only logistical thing I'd make, and I'd want to make sure we talk to our, our fantastic tech person, if we run up against the time, this meeting, this chamber has to be turned into what we can do with broadcast. So I, that's the only reason why I would hesitate potentially to do that, um, because it actually gets formatted and, and, and tested and everything. Um, but, you know, maybe with that 15 minutes while we're all getting a snack, <laughs> they have time to do that. So. Just if we do it here. You were talking correct, about correct. Yep. Either way, right. But if we did it here, we would have the logistics of that chain. All right. Yeah, that's all. Anything else to add? Would the broadcast be available happening like YouTube or something like that? Well, again, to be determined. I, I think the uh, whether or not we want to have a camera component or simply an audio component of recording the meeting, I think we, we have to decide on and have a meeting. I think the I'm, I'm hearing consensus moving toward more audio than actually being on camera, but again, it's something we can, we'll, we'll see what we can put together. That's a good point too. Um, I, there was only one other thing I think I heard. Um, there was some question in my mind about how, whether it was an, a one at a time, everybody gets addressed. If there was a, an opportunity, so let's say somebody from my district wanted to speak directly to me, if I stepped away and talked to them while you were having a conversation, I, I don't want to prevent that if that's something we want to do, but at the same time, it makes it kind of logistically challenging to get it on the record. So I, I, I throw that out there. You know, I don't know what you all think is you get more con you get more opportunities if we're having smaller conversations, you know, concurrently. But it also it also may make it more difficult to follow all the conversations. So I don't know if you all have an opinion on that, but that's something else I think we need to iron out a little bit. Um, I'd want to, you know, if each one of us is talking to somebody, you're getting through seven every three, you know, it, it's faster and there's more opportunity, but maybe it doesn't really facilitate the, the, um, the recording think, portion of it. Yeah, the recording and the bigger yeah. picture of talking to the council. I mean, Correct. anytime they could buy you a cup of coffee and <laughs> right. have that one-on-one, -on -one, this sure. is an opportunity to talk to all seven of us. Sure. Mr. That's Mayor and council members, can I yes. remind you that we shouldn't ask them to buy you a cup of coffee? I, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Literally going to make that. We, we will buy you right. coffee. You are not buying us coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Council Member Nelson, Council Member Loman, Council Member Nelson. Yeah. Uh, in a similar vein to that, I could see a situation where more than one person wanted to come in to talk about a topic, and how would we handle that? Because now we have one person speaking at a time, but maybe a small group wanted to come in, two, three people that had a similar issue to have that conversation. How do we facilitate that in this as well? Yep. Council Member Loman. Mayor, I want to be just as respectful as I possibly can. And this had been a great conversation and dialogue. And I, I wow, when I got on council, I thought this would be the, the type of dialogue we'd have. But you know, with that being said, we have a lot on our agenda and we need to move forward. So if there's any way we could wrap this up so we can keep moving. I was bringing it back down the dais and, and we were going to be done here. I think, did you have one more? 
Council, uh, staff, do you have enough to move on here? Mr. Mayor and council members, we do. Good. And uh, we will uh, expedite this and turn it around for discussion next week. Very good. Thank you. Can we say thank you? Thank you. Thank you all. All right, because it's on the agenda here, folks, uh, we, I, I would like to make a motion that we lay this over until next uh, meeting uh, with the direction to staff to, uh, to, to flesh this out a bit and put some meat on the bones and, and develop this a little bit more for discussion then. Second. We've got a motion and a second. I think Nathan, I heard Nathan first. By Council Member Coulter to lay this over until next week with direction as, uh, as outlined. Are there no further council discussion on this? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Motion carries 7-0. All right. Well done. Thank you very much. Moving on, or actually doubling back to our consent agenda, <laughs> Council Member Carter, our consent business this evening. All right. So I have. I'm not sure if I have any holds. Does anybody want to hold anything? At this point, no. <laughs> okay. Going once, going twice. Okay, so I would move approval of items 6.1 through 6.9. Second. Motion by Council Member Carter, second by Council Member D'Alessandro to accept tonight's consent business as stated, item 6.1 through 6.9. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion carries 7-0. Moving on to item seven on our agenda, which is the hearings, resolutions, and ordinances. We have two public hearings this evening. And the first is item 7.1, which is a public hearing uh, regarding council member district, our council member district ordinance and the 2022 polling place resolution. Our city clerk, Ms. Scipioni, is back once again. Welcome back, nice job earlier. Thank you very much for the swearing in. Oh, thank you, Mayor and Council. It's one of the best parts of my job. It's fun, isn't it? Great. <laughs> So, thank you. Well, thank you, Mayor and Council. I appreciate being in front of you for the third time in as many weeks, I think, um, to hopefully finalize our redistricting um, for 2020 and the next 10 years. Um, I wanted to acknowledge, because I forgot to do so last time before I get started, um, that City Planner Mike Palermo had quite a, uh, to put quite a bit of work into these maps and this information as well. And I just want to make sure that I acknowledge him as part of the redistricting team. Um, even though I'm the face up here, he's really the person behind all of the great mapping that was done. So just wanted to acknowledge him. Um, as a reminder of our redistricting timeline, for those folks at home, um, we started February 15th when the legislative maps were released. Um, at the February 28th council meeting, we did a re overview of the redistricting process, all the different rules and requirements we need to follow. On March 7th, um, we brought forward the first round of redistricting maps um, for council review, and also we held a public comment opportunity at that point because before we brought back a final ordinance, we really wanted to give the public an opportunity to weigh in on the maps if they so chose. Now that brings us to tonight, uh, March 21st, where we're holding our official public hearing on the ordinance itself for redistricting, um, and then considering the resolution for the, the precincts and the polling locations. Uh, I think as the mayor mentioned earlier in the meeting, March 29th is our statutory deadline for completion. Um, and then it goes from us to the county, um, and their deadline for their redistricting process is April 26th. I did want to share that they're planning on having public hearings April 12th and 19th. So once we see some um, draft maps um, at the county level, we'll be sure to share those out with council so you can see what those look like. Um, and then these um, new boundaries are effective with the August 9th primary. Next slide, please. So as a reminder, um, at its heart, the purpose of redistricting is to balance our population within our council member districts. And the charter says that's 5%, um, no greater than 5% between our most populous and our least populous districts. And then it's also to ensure that our precinct boundaries do not cross any legislative boundaries. Um, state statute says a precinct can only contain one state legislative boundary and one city council legislative um, district, I should say. Next slide, please. 
So as we all kind of know at this point, the total difference between our most populous and our least populous districts is 6.2%. So we're outside of that 5% that's required by city charter. Um, and so as we, we were developing these maps, we didn't have to make huge changes to our city council districts in order to bring us into that 5%, but we did need to do some shifts um, so that district four lost a little bit of population and district two gained a bit of population. So I'll have you go to the next slide, thank you. This is what our city council districts currently look like. And if we go to the next slide, you can see where we are proposing to make changes. And those are those hatched areas. And so basically what we're doing is we're shifting some population from district four, our most populous, to district one. And then we're shifting population from district one to district two. Unfortunately, our most populous and our least populous don't share a boundary. So we kind of had to do this shift on both ends of district one um, in order to balance that population. And then district three boundaries remain the same. If you go to the next map, then this is what um, the final proposed district boundaries would look like for the next 10 years. Next slide, please. Our population count then, um, as you can see from the shifting, we were very fortunate to find areas of the city that pretty much almost perfectly balanced out. Um, district one lost six. <laughs> um, district two gained 575 in population, three stayed the same, and then um, four um, decreased by 569. And then those changes then created a total difference between our districts, um, our most populous and our least populous of 1.96% which is well under that 5% required by charter. Now that we have both the state legislative boundaries and our proposed council boundaries, then we look into our precincts and the boundaries between our precincts. Um, we, as I mentioned earlier, have to make sure that our precinct boundaries follow our state legislative boundaries and our city legislative boundaries. Um, we also did some, some kind of cleanup and some right sizing. Um, so you'll notice now there's nice sequential numbering of all of our precincts, which is a type A person, makes me very excited. Um, it also helps us more transparently report out results um, and administratively kind of just helps us as we're, as we're administering um, election day um, uh, support and as the county is administering absentee voting. Our precinct number actually decreased um, from 32 to 31. Um, and part of the reason for that was where our legislative boundaries were drawn. Um, and it just, we were able to kind of right size some of our precincts that had been undersized because of prior legislative boundaries. And some of that was due to the fact that where those boundaries were drawn, it really, we would have resulted in kind of two tiny precincts that would have been harder to staff and harder to have a polling location versus one where we could staff robustly. Um, I will mention we are still well under kind of what the county and the state and a lot of our peer cities have for um, total number of over 18 population in our precincts. So I still feel very comfortable in our ability to serve all of our residents in our precincts. Um, with the proposed changes, approximately 25% of the voters in Bloomington will have new polling places. The good news is we know where that's located, right? So we can start doing some targeted outreach, making sure folks know where their new polling location would be. So I'll have you go to the next slide. This is our current precinct map with our new legislative boundaries. Um, and it's a little hard to see, but the, the bottom line with this map is it doesn't follow our new legislative boundaries, which changed quite significantly this year. So if you go to the new map, you can see now where we have those green lines, which are our state legislative boundaries, the precincts match those. And then you can also see where our council district boundaries have changed. The precinct boundaries have changed to match those lines as well. And then you'll see that beautiful numbering all through the city. <laughs> I'll have you go to the next slide, please. So assuming um, action on this tonight, our next stop, step is really voter education. Right, and I've talked about this interdepartmental team that's gonna be working on timing for, sorry, it should say Bloomington briefing, um, social media, website, and different outreach opportunities, especially to those areas of the city where we know we have changes to their polling locations. Um, 
the county will be sending out postcards to all registered voters, whether or not their polling place changed, um, so that they know where their current precinct is, what their current precinct number is, what their current district numbers are. And we've learned that the county will be sending those out in July ahead of the August primary. And then, of course, we'll be working with our election judges a little more extensively this year on their greeting duties to ensure that our election judges understand how to direct a voter to a new polling location if they end up in the wrong spot, how to kind of explain a little bit of why their polling place changed, and really make sure that even if a voter does somehow slip through the crack and end up in the wrong polling location, they're getting a nice, friendly, helpful answer um, and redirection to the correct polling location um, at their polls. Sorry, this didn't format well, but the, there's actually three proposed actions before you tonight. Um, the first, after we hold a public hearing, would be to adopt the ordinance that adopts the council member districts. Um, then there's a resolution directing a summary publication of that ordinance. And then finally, a resolution adopting the precincts and the polling locations. And that concludes my presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. Council questions? This is uh, a lot of the information we saw previously. We've been through this uh, on a couple of different occasions, actually. Anything? Seeing none, I would like to open this. This is a public hearing. This is item 7.1, a public hearing regarding the council member district ordinance and the 2022 polling place resolution. Is there anyone here in the council chambers who wishes to speak to item 7.1 on tonight's agenda? Uh, my name is Keith Grinde. I just have a quick question of curiosity, not criticism. But I'm in the one precinct that's being eliminated. I know I still get a vote, but is it, I'm just kind of I'm just kind of curious why that one was eliminated. That's all. Uh, was the Nativity of Mary not want to do it any longer, or was it just population, or that's all? Did, did you have any additional questions? I'll, I'll call her back up. No, that's the only question uh, I had. So, okay, why the elimination? All right. Don't take it personally. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Grindy. Yep. And we will still have places for everybody to vote. Um, <laughs> Mayor and Council, um, to answer Mr. Grindy's question, um, it was a combination of some logistical challenges um, that the polling place was experiencing, and then also just the changes in the legislative boundaries within District 1 really changed where we need to, to draw our precinct boundaries. And so it was a natural area for us to kind of um, consolidate a few different polling locations um, and move some populations to some different locations. Answer the question, Mr. Grindy? Thank Perfect, thanks. Anyone else here in the council chambers wish to speak on item 7.1 tonight? Leah, do we have anyone on the phone who wishes to speak to item 7.1? May continue. We don't have anyone on the phone as of the moment, Mr. Mayor. You may continue. Thank you, Leah. Council seeing no one coming forward and no one on the phone line to speak to item 7.1, I look for a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Council Member uh, Coulter, second by Council Member D'Alessandro to close the public hearing on item 7.1. Hearing no further council discussion on this issue, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, motion carries 7-0. Council, any discussion on this, any questions? As I said, we've been through this at least a couple of times. If not, I would look for action. Council Member Coulter. This is just a great night for process nerd, Nathan. <laughs> uh, Mayor, I will move to adopt an ordinance adopting Council Member District boundaries for elections. Second. Motion by Council Member Coulter, second by Council Member Lohman to adopt an ordinance adopting Council Member District boundaries for elections. No further council discussion on this? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. I will move to adopt a resolution directing, directing summary publication of an ordinance adopting council member district boundaries for elections. Second. Motion by Council Member Coulter, second by Council Member Lohman to adopt a resolution directing, uh, excuse me, to uh, adopting council member district boundaries for elections. No further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 
Aye. Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Councilmember Coulter. All right. Motion carries 7-0, just to for the, the record. Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. I will move to adopt a resolution establishing precinct boundaries and polling places for elections. Second. Motion and a second by Councilmember Lohman to adopt uh, precinct boundaries and polling places for elections. No further council discussion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Ms. Scipioni, you disappeared, but thank you so very much. I know this was a, uh, this is a big thing every 10 years, and it's a big important thing every 10 years, and I appreciate the work that went into this, and I appreciate the thought that went into it, and I appreciate the renumbering, because as I said, I tried to do that 10 years ago and got nowhere with it, so I appreciate <laughs> that. I think it's great, uh, but well done. Thank you so very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Mary and Council. And if you could pass it on to the rest of your staff and to the planning team that worked on it to put the map together as well. We appreciate great. that. Thank Thanks. you. Next on our agenda is item 7.2, another public hearing. This is regarding city code amendments allowing dogs in outdoor dining areas. Lynn Moore from our environmental health. Good evening, welcome. Thank you, Mayor and Council. And you know, I can't help but take the pun. Meeting is going to the dogs now. <laughs> <laughs> well done. <laughs> so Lynn, I was just going to say, we haven't seen you here at the council in so long, and maybe it'll be long again. I'm going to keep doing puns like that. So, good evening. Um, just in all seriousness, since 1987, the city has licensed and inspected food service establishments like restaurants and coffee shops under a delegation agreement with the Minnesota Department of Health. The Minnesota Department of Health does not allow dogs inside food establishments and only allows them in outdoor dining areas if the municipality allows it by ordinance under a permit. So cities that have taken this into their ordinances to allow dogs in outdoor dining areas include Minneapolis, St. Paul, Edina, St. Louis Park, and Rochester. Next slide, please. Under Minnesota statute section 157.175, cities may adopt into ordinance uh, permitting procedures for these licensed food establishments to allow dogs to accompany patrons in outdoor dining areas. Permit holders must provide signs in the area, not allow dangerous or potentially dangerous dogs, prohibit employees from handling the dogs, not allow dogs to contact food service items or to be on dining room furniture, and clean up dog waste immediately after accidents. Next slide, please. Establishments are not required to allow dogs, so this is an important thing. So it's only those licensed establishments who really want this, right? So nobody, the city would not be requiring any restaurants to require dogs, except um, there's nothing that limits a person with disabilities to access places of accommodation while accompanied by a service animal. So that's an important distinction, distinction, or the lawful use of a service animal by a licensed peace officer. Um, so just to make that clear, everybody has to allow that. Um, there is a proposed one-time permit application fee of $50. Um, the permits are automatically renewed annually and be, will be printed right on the city-issued food license. So it's like they apply once and it just stays with the business as long as they operate. Um, and the permits would not be transferable and would expire automatically upon the sale of the establishment. So it's pretty straightforward. Next slide, please. Um, along with this ordinance change, we also are trying to make uh, just a few miscellaneous, miscellaneous updates for clarity, um, including not adopting the state's licensing section in uh, Minnesota statutes section 28A.08 as requested specifically by the Department of Agriculture, who we also have a delegation agreement to do inspections with, and minor edits to food supplemental facility and temporary food establishment license district district uh, can't talk tonight descriptions in chapter 14 and appendix a on march 9th an e-subscribe message was sent to over 1100 subscribers mostly owners and managers of restaurants 
interested in food safety, inviting comments on the proposed ordinance. This item's description um, says, no comments were received, but we did receive one email that was attached to the item. So I just wanna point that out. And I did respond to uh, that resident's email uh, in describing how the requirements that we would be adopting in code come right out of state statutes, not that we kind of came up with them. We're just it's kind of a copy and paste. These amendments um, were used in piloting the racial equity impact assessment tool. The findings indicate no adverse impacts or unintended consequences to racial or ethnic groups. Choosing to allow dogs in outdoor dining areas may bring new customers to BIPOC-owned food establishments, especially if located in areas where residents frequently walk their dogs. Creating the opportunity to have the choice contributes to making Bloomington businesses vibrant and customer focused. With this um, agenda item, there are two actions before you. One is to adopt the ordinance as proposed, and secondly, to adopt a resolution for summary publication of the ordinance. Are there any questions? Thank you. Um, questions, Council. Actually, I, I have one. So the, the, the $50, the one-time fee, will that be used for, for like initial inspection? And, and I only ask that because I've been in more than one establishment in, in my life, if you can imagine that. Um, but where it's more of a patio, and it's kind of like the roll-up garage doors as opposed to an actual outdoor kind of seating area. And, um, and I know it's kind of a gray area, but I, is, is, the, is the application fee an opportunity for inspection to make sure when we're all on the same page in terms of what an outdoor area is? Um, thank you for the question, Mr. Mayor, Mayor and Council. Um, you know, partly, I, th I would say the $50 fee is mostly for admin because we, we inspect the restaurants already twice a year, plus any needed follow-up. This is gonna be rolled into part of our routine and follow-up inspection. Obviously, if we got complaints, we would investigate them. Um, the way that this statute is presented really mirrors how like the smoke-free uh, state statutes are written, where it's, it's really the permittee or the proprietor who has to take the responsibility. Those that want this have to follow and enforce the, the rules. So um, it would be a matter of our staff upon you know, routine or regular inspection, if they happen to notice the signs in the patio area when they're going through their inspection process to have the conversation. Obviously, initially, you know, we're gonna be you know, using our staff you know, bringing the, the conversation to them that this is, you know, something they could do if they wanted. Um, so, you know, it's, it's not going to be a big burden at all for us to Understood. handle. Okay, good, good to know. Council, additional questions? Council Member D'Alessandro. Um, as a follow-up to your question, Mr. Mayor, it, it begs the question to me, do, <laughs> I see what I did there with the dog reference too, see, I'm with you on the same page um the the do, do we need to have it be a separate thing or can it be something that gets rolled up into the license that you do already um and what would be the reason why you'd want to have it separate versus rolled up into the license so if somebody did have an outdoor facility and they applied for a license we would just do it automatically um as part of that is and i'm just kind of curious if this is if there's a reason we have to have it kind of separate and distinct from the actual proprietor license itself more? Uh, good question, uh, Mayor, uh, Council Member D'Alessandro. Uh, um, state statute calls out that we must have a permit for it. You know, it, 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 and, and, and the licensee has to ask for it. Once they apply for it, you know, it's going to be attached to their license in our software system. And each year, when they w they renew their food license, you know they're not going to pay another fee. It's just going to be in there, and it's going to print on their license. And the the ability to be able to um, go to our uh, software system and say, well, how many places in Bloomington are dog friendly? You know, we can produce that list. We can send out information, or we can provide that inter information to uh, residents or visitors who want to visit that type of place. So. Additional questions, Council? Seeing none, 
I will open the public hearing on item 7.2. This is a public hearing for city code amendments allowing dogs in outdoor dining areas. Is there anyone here in the council chambers who wishes to speak to item 7.2? Seeing no one coming forward. Leah, is there anyone on the phone who wishes to speak to item 7.2? We still have no one on the phone, phone line, Mr. Mayor. We can still continue. Thank you. Last call for anyone in the chambers? Council seeing no one coming forward, having no one on the phone, I'd look for a motion to close the public hearing on item 7.2. So moved. Second. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember Lohman to close the public hearing on item 7.2. And no further council discussion on this matter. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, aye. motion carries 7-0. Council questions, comments, thoughts on allowing dogs in outdoor dining areas. Councilmember Lohman. Oh, thank you, Mayor. I, I guess what I'd say is, uh, given that this is a permitted use, and it sounds like the um, you know other cities that are utilizing it don't, there doesn't seem to be a groundswell of people that are coming forward and and uh, protesting it. I think it's something that's uh, worthwhile having us uh, uh, do this. I know we've got a number of pubs and a number of you know, you know some folks that actually were born and raised here too wanted to do this with their stuff. So uh, you know, I'm I'm open to the idea of of letting folks do that. So. Others? I would agree with you, council member, especially over the last couple of years as we've seen a lot of establishments expand their outdoor seating areas. This just gives them a, if you want to bring Fido along with you or Rowdy, you can, you can do that and bring the dog with you as you go. So uh, with no further questions, council, I would look for action on item 7.2. Uh, Mayor, I'm happy to get it rolling. Council member Martin. Uh, Mayor, I move that we adopt an ordinance creating permits to allow dogs in outdoor areas of licensed food service establishments and making miscellaneous updates for clarity, thereby amending Chapter 14 and Appendix A of the City Code. Second. Motion by Councilmember Martin, second by Councilmember Lohman, to adopt an ordinance creating permits to allow dogs in outdoor dining areas and to uh, make up, uh, miscellaneous updates and for clarity, thereby amending Chapter 14 and Appendix A of the City Code. No further council discussion on this matter? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Council Member Martin. Mayor I, Mayor, I move we adopt a resolution authorizing summary publication of an ordinance creating permits to allow dogs in outdoor areas of licensed food service establishments and making miscellaneous updates for clarity, thereby amending Chapter 14 and Appendix A of the City Code. Second. Motion by Council Member Martin, second by Council Member Lohman for, uh, for summary publication. Council, no further discussion? All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries 7-0. Leah, we are done with our public hearings for this evening. Thank you for your help. You can sign off for now. Thank you much. You're most welcome. You're most welcome, Mr. Mayor. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. We will move on to item 8 on our agenda, our organizational business. And our first item is 8.1, which is actually a study item for discussion. And it is regarding our food truck standards, something we have been talking about, it seems like, for a long while. Uh, Mr. James from our planning department is going to lead us through this. Is, is he online or is he here? I'm online. There he is. There, my screen was blank. I was wondering. Good evening, Mr. James. Welcome. Good evening, Mayor. Thank you. And council members, so I'll um, pull up the slides here. There we go. Okay, so I'm bringing back before you tonight a, a study item on our food trucks. You recall um, on the next slide, you know, we had some initial study meetings back in 2019 um, to get some initial di direction here on, you know, do we want to be more prohibitive or more permissive with food trucks? And, um, you know, got direction from both the Planning Commission and City Council for a more permissive approach. No, we did say it with tighter standards and kind of left it open for what that would mean. Um, and so we drafted an initial ordinance early 2020, brought that before the planning commission. Um, and that item was continued. You know, we received some feedback from the food truck association at that public hearing. Um, and so made some tweaks to the ordinance uh, in accordance with the planning commission comments also. And so uh, the Planning Commission did recommend approval of the ordinance um, back in March 2020. And that's, that's the draft that's attached here tonight for you to review. 
But um, the reason we're doing this um, is really just to clarify the zoning code, you know, whether we want to allow food trucks or not. We really need some clear language in the zoning code. And currently, the zoning code is the primary barrier uh, in allowing food trucks throughout the city. And then in doing this update, we also saw an opportunity to create a new food truck license. I'll talk more on. So there was uh, some outreach done initially as part of the ordinance. You know, we uh, interacted directly with the Food Truck Association and some of the restaurants in town. We sent memos out to the related organizations. Um, and then before we, uh, this meeting tonight, I did reach out to a few restaurants and the food truck organization, um, kind of bringing some of those same parties back into the conversation again, as, as well as a few new ones. So, um, you know, speaking with the, the restaurant owners and managers and food trucks, um, you know, learned as, as a uh, result of the pandemic, you know, they've had to adapt. Um, as expected, you know, food trucks have, uh, have found that, you know, tap rooms maybe had limited hours or started to close some of the in-person uh, dining areas. And so food trucks had to, um, you know, find new events maybe drive a little bit further to find um, places to operate. And, you know, restaurants, as we're familiar, have had a, a tough time too. So they've, um, a lot of them have looked to online ordering services and curbside delivery. And some of them, you know, have, have maintained those services, maybe not curbside delivery, but online ordering is still popular. Um, and so, you know, I have heard that a lot of them are, uh, to use one of the phrases, cautiously optimistic about the future. Uh, you know, people are starting to return in person and, you know, a lot of people are excited to do so. Um, the graph on this slide is a little bit different from the staff report. So this is an updated uh, survey from earlier this year of, um, of uh, uh, restaurants and food service establishments statewide. Um, and it's you know a response to if the if the business has returned and if revenues have returned to pre-pandemic levels or not. And so I'm looking roughly 47% are um, uh, hopeful that you know by the end of this year pre-pandemic business will return, but there's still what 53% that are saying you know 2023 or, or later is when they anticipate business to return uh, to that pre-pandemic level. Um, and I did take the opportunity since I was speaking with them to ask about, you know, how they felt about food trucks and this ordinance. And, you know, um, food trucks uh, stated, you know, their not, intent is not to go out and compete directly with restaurants. You know, they see them as, as um, uh, you know, equal players and they don't want to put each other out of business. and. Um, restaurants too, you know, they're not, most of them aren't opposed to seeing food trucks, um, but they do want fair application of, you know, regulations and the standards fees. There's a couple of um, code updates too, since uh, this item last came up. One is that we do have a new tap room use now. And so they're certainly interested in food trucks and, you know, a lot of synergy between the uses. Um, and also we adopted odor control standards for food establishments. And so what that means is any um, restaurant within 200 feet, feet of, a, of a residential structure needs an odor control device, kind of like what's pictured on the screen. And uh, you know, food trucks don't have these. They operate with their windows open and um, it's not a reality to have an odor control device. So this standard would uh, effectively prohibit food trucks near residences unless there's uh, some exception made to what's drafted. Um, you know, the staff report in previous study meetings, we talked to more pros and cons on food trucks. I'll just quickly um, summarize now, you know, pros are more about creating vitality around certain locations. And we see them at events often or, or in conjunction with tap rooms. Um, cons were more related to, um, you know, since they're mobile, they move around. There's can be concerns about enforcement. Um, there are also concerns about competition with restaurants and 
Um, you know, restaurants bring up the point of um, not wanting to allow food trucks to circumvent the standards that are required of of restaurants. So that was a concern. But you know, both serve food but operate quite differently. So restaurants, obviously, brick and mortar, kind of set location. Um, you know, they offered indoor dining services, which is a little bit easier to do in the winters than, than say, a food truck. Uh, you know, longer me uh, longer menus, and they can serve alcohol, whereas food trucks cannot. Um, oftentimes, they'll bring up that they pay a fair amount in property tax, and um, food trucks, you know, don't have that property tax. However, I, I will note that we would require food trucks to be associated with a licensed commissary kitchen. And so there's fees associated with that also. And, you know, we always compare the two, but sometimes the, uh, they go hand in hand. You know, some restaurants have a food truck, so they're not always in competition. But the standards I'll, I'll quickly highlight here and walk you through kind of a review approval process. But one thing to note when I start to talk about like the operational and location standards, um, this is what's been proposed for food trucks that would operate outside of events. And so the idea is, you know, right now we allow food trucks with events, say the farmer's market or summer fed or really any event. You know, those are subject to um, a separate review and approval process. And so the standards we talk about tonight don't apply to those food trucks. <clears throat> I do want to touch on quick the license that's proposed. So all food trucks are required to have a food establishment license. Right now, they apply for a, a temporary food license. And so that license is um, you know, per location. So if there's different events, different areas, they need a separate license uh, for each location. And then um, there's different types to you know, complex and simple. A complex usually requires more um, food handling, uh, you know, meats, sandwiches, simple. I, I gave examples of you know, if it's coffee or popcorn, a little less food handling. But I think it's safe to assume most food trucks would fit under the complex category. Um, and so what's proposed then is that uh, there be a new food truck license. Uh, we still have the breakdown complex or simple, but uh, a food truck would just need the one license then to operate at any location in the city. And so, you know, I'd streamline the process a little bit for both staff and, and food trucks. And, um, you know, it does mean that, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more here on the process. And next slide. So um, now under the existing process, food trucks tell us kind of when and where they plan to operate with that license application. And what's proposed then is um, food trucks uh, just apply for the one food truck license. As part of that, they tell us uh, what their licensed commissary kitchen is. We wouldn't necessarily require that in the city now, if it's outside the city, we might call up um, that city and make sure the commissary kitchen is licensed. Um, but uh, yeah, with this new license, then um, we would require the commissary kitchen and certified uh, food manager status. But we may not know exactly um, when and where the food truck would be operating. They might tell us, but it wouldn't be a requirement because they could. It would allow them to operate uh, anywhere. But we would know which which food trucks are licensed, um, and then they would have to be inspected before operating. So they come into the city, uh, maybe Civic Plaza or, or somewhere else, and get inspected. And then they'd probably they would be inspected at least you know once or twice um, when operating. Uh, they would have to work with. Uh, the property owner at whatever site they're looking at to get permission to operate there. And then, uh, you know, operating would be subject to standards still. So um, the standards are, you know, set hours of operation, not overnight. Uh, really no signage unless it's attached to the vehicle. And then um, they have to pack up and go at the end of the day, so they can't stay overnight. Um, at any one location. And we're proposing this as a pilot project 
um, such that staff would, um, you know, after the ordinance is adopted, that we would um, kind of take the year review, um, what's worked, what hasn't, and bring it back and, and see if any changes are needed to the ordinance. Um, one other quick thing too here. So on the overnight stay, staff has spoken with a restaurant owner lately, and they're interested in hosting food trucks at their property. Um, so this is a little different scenario than we anticipated originally, um, because the proposed standards don't allow food trucks to stay on site overnight. And so um, something to think about during discussion is uh, if we want to change the, the drafted language to allow food trucks to operate at a location with a restaurant or commissary kitchen and then stay at that same location overnight. So uh, just something to think about. But then, um, so the standards for location are different based on whether it's at a non-residential or a residential location. So with non-residential, we're proposing that food trucks be off street and most likely it's in a parking lot area, might occupy a space or two. Um, no more than three trucks at a, at a location and then you know, 200 feet away from restaurants. And then at residential, you know, this was really aimed at more, say, the graduation party, um, in which uh, you know houses might want uh, a food truck, and so we're saying you know one food truck at a time, a limit three days per year, a little bit more limited hours of operation, and then really just intended for those private guests. You know, it's not a block party, um, but we do allow in this case uh, what's proposed is that food trucks be allowed on site or on the street. Um, serving the, the nearest residents being served. And so um, one point that was brought up is that some driveways are slanted and can't host a food truck. So this was an alternative for that. So then um, tonight, staff is looking for direction on A, if we want, should prepare an ordinance for um, public hearing for consideration. And then also if any changes are needed to what's been drafted thus far. And I bulleted out the topics I brought up um, to brought up tonight here is, you know, one, should we make food trucks exempt from odor control standards? And then also, you know, in the event that uh, a restaurant or commissary kitchen has a food truck, can they operate and store at that same location? So with that, I'm Happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. James. Council, I saw a lot of you taking notes. Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor, uh, and thank you, Mr. James. Uh, so I guess I'll first just say that I really appreciate that the residential standards and uh, have been separated out from the other zoning districts. I think that's super helpful. As it relates to the residential requirements, uh, I guess I'm – I'm wondering why we would need the service to be limited to private guests only. And so I'm just imagining like if I had a snow cone food truck come to my neighborhood for Evelyn's birthday party, and then all the other little kids in the neighborhood saw the snow cone truck and they wanted to come over and get a snow cone. I mean, I would let them get a snow cone. So I guess I'm just wondering, <laughs> I'm not gonna tell five-year-olds in my neighborhood, no, it's a snow cone. So. <laughs> no. So I guess I'm just kind of wondering about that piece. Uh, and I would, I guess I would advocate that maybe we be more flexible on that. And then the other question related to the residential piece, uh, the one mobile food unit may operate at one time on a site. And I guess I'm just wondering for that, I mean, in theory, two houses could invite two food trucks and there could be two food trucks out there, right? We wouldn't be, I'm assuming we wouldn't be monitored. I mean, we wouldn't say no, you can't do that because there's already going to be, like, they could kind of organize that way. Mr. James? Right. Thanks, Mayor, Councilmember Carter. So, yeah, you bring up some good points. And, um, uh, you know, some of these are tough because, you know, we haven't had food trucks um, before in the city operating this way. And um, uh, I, I anticipate some of this will be, um, you know, see, see what happens. And, um, adjust the ordinance accordingly. Yeah, so in terms of serving private guests at residence, you know, there's concerns about um, um, 
Yeah, not so much that, you know, the neighbor kid wanders by and also wants the ice cream cone, but we're maybe concerned about abuse of, of the, the use in which it becomes more of a commercial operation rather than just a, a private event. Um, so yeah, the intent was to um, try to maintain more of that residential, quiet, um, single family character of neighborhoods um, as much as possible. And then, um, sorry, your other point here was about no more than one at a time. And, and you don't really have to respond to that. I just, I just wanted to make sure I understood that right. Okay, yep. Uh, so back to the last one. I guess I, I feel like if a food truck is invited by a resident for a specific event, and then other people in the neighborhood may purchase food at that food truck, I would be – I would think that we should be open to that. I mean, I wouldn't want food trucks just driving around neighborhoods and pulling up and parking anywhere and serving people. I, I totally understand that. But if they're invited specifically by a resident and, you know, it's okay for them to be there, I think having a little more flexibility in the language would be good. The other thing I wanted to ask about, uh, so in, in the documents it says there's a proposal to add standard allowing three food trucks on a site that is not associated with an event. So say at the Normandale Lake District, a group of businesses decide to invite food trucks and they're not really monitoring the amount. Food trucks are just allowed to kind of show up. First, I guess my question is, would they be allowed to just show up, you know, if there was kind of a broad invite to food trucks to come on Wednesday afternoons? And then would we still limit it to three? How would we monitor that? Uh, thanks, Council Member Carter. So. Um, we kind of put the onus somewhat on the property owner here to make sure that the food trucks are complying with the code. Um, and so, you know, depending at what site that is, they'd have to, you know, make sure there's no more than three at a time there. Um, and I suppose it'd be property owner to property owner. You know, if it was a city owned parcel, we would, um, you know, develop internal policy or, or, um, uh, and on how to handle that. Okay. My last question. Do ice cream trucks fall under this ordinance? Because I have seen a lot of conversation about ice cream trucks and the de desire to see them. <laughs> the desire is just curious. Uh, thanks, Council Member Carter. So they fall under a separate category, okay. not included with food trucks. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. Uh, to the questions that you asked, I do think we should exempt the food trucks, and I do think we should allow... Sorry, from the odor control. And then I do think that we should allow for storage or on-site uh, service if it, the restaurant owns the food truck. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, just a few quick questions. The um, residential standards, three days a year, is that a calendar year or is that a 365-day a period? Yeah, thanks, Councilmember Carter or or Coulter. Sorry, um, not the first time. <laughs> um, I have to double check the language on that. So the ish, the license is issued um, kind of on a rolling basis. Um, however, we process. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm learning now. It's through a camp calendar year. Okay, so meaning that if I have a food truck at my house in June of one year, I'd be okay having it at my house in April of the following year. Correct. Okay. Okay. That, I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you. Um, and then as far as location, um, it says food trucks would not be allowed to operate on streets or other public rights of way. Would that include streets with on street parking? Um, Correct. Yeah, Councilmember Coulter, that's correct. And, um, you know, there's quite a few streets that are, um, you know, even if they allow on-street parking, there's time limits and other um, um, maybe regulations or permits there. So we just opted to prohibit food trucks outright um, at those non-residential locations on street. Okay. Um I don't know how much more discussion we're going to have on that. That that might be something to think about um, as far. I mean, yes, you know, time limits being what they are for on-street parking. Um, 
but it, it, it might be something in, in terms of sort of opening it up a little bit more that we might want to might want to take some into um, some consideration and then um, to your your questions I uh, agree with councilmember Carter I, I think exempting them from from odor control is is fine and I, I think it makes sense um, for for food trucks to be stored overnight at their you know by their commissary kitchen I, I think that that's perfectly convenient makes a lot of sense Councilmember member Alessandro I will get to the questions first and then I have a couple of my own but to, um, I actually um, I would personally like to see all restaurants exempted from some of our what I think are onerous odor control situations candidly I think when I spoke with uh, um, uh, Gino over at Geropolis or uh, Dino sorry um, he you know one of the main reasons he was originally against uh, food trucks was uh, because he felt like the burden was unduly on restaurants and that this is an easy way for people to get a pass on a lot of that stuff. So it's worth us considering like how we look at restaurant versus food truck and try to balance that out a little bit. So that would be my comment at this point. Um, uh, overnight on uh, at the place location, I think th the way to solve for that is just make sure that they've identified for you um, the address of their commissary kitchen or restaurant and then that's the one place that they can store them and that makes total sense to me. Um, Questions. Uh, first one is um, when you you mentioned that there was a uh, the the option was the license uh, for uh, kind of um, a, a yearly basis. Is that right? As an annual renewal? Does um, and I assume that that means then that's a citywide license of uh, and that that operator can run anywhere in the city um, that they've been invited to uh, participate. Is that correct? Do I have that right? Yep, that's correct. Okay. Um, great. That solves another problem uh, of some of the things I've heard, which is excellent. Um, the the um, notion of um, locations for uh, commercial. If I um, if I'm the if I'm not a property owner, I guess. Um, let's say, for example, I'm a. Um, uh, I am. I'm going to make this up. I'm the the. Um, leather shop at the uh at the Penn Lake uh at the Penn Lake Plaza right and I want to have a food truck um maybe a beef food truck because it goes with leather or something um I'm not the property owner I'm a le I'm a lessee of of that location um do who has to be the one that invites the food truck like how does that work can I as the proprietor of the shop invite or do I have to go get the plaza owner people to agree to have that on site yeah, thanks, our council member D'Alessandro. So typically it'll be the property owner. Sometimes there's um, you know, agreements in place that allow the lessee to make some of those decisions. Um, I guess we would default to kind of who we have on, on record as property owner or um, manager of the site in some cases. Okay, so they, they would most likely be instructed by us to ensure that they've gotten whatever permissions they need to for their site and kind of leave it at that and then worry about it if it causes a kerfuffle. Yeah. Okay. What about, um, what about mun municipality locations? So for example, if, um, if they wanted to have food trucks at a football game at, at the, at the stadium, um, does, does that, does that follow the same, rules then or is there some extra burden because it's on municipal property that needs to be considered right and that's kind of part of ongoing discussions depending on um, direction here is um you know what that internal um policy looks like I, I imagine parks would maybe take the lead at, at thinking some of our park sites but um you know whether or not there's additional city standards for city properties that's uh, kind of remains to be discussed Okay, that's all I have for now. Thanks. Council, additional questions? Council Member Lohman. Wow, doing a shot in there. <laughs> yeah, that's catchy. Um, so, uh, can we go back to those questions so I can? So I, can yeah. see I got my own too, but uh, let's just start there. Sorry, one minute. So I guess the first one's about order. And so I guess what I would say is I agree with Council Member uh, De La Sandra, uh, that uh, we kind of need to have the same standards for, um, 
you know, brick and mortar as we would have for, um, uh, you know, for these uh, food trucks. So I, I would, I think it would be, I think it'd be strange not to have that. And I, I guess, you know, and I, I would just, I would err on the side of being careful with that. Cause when you change that standard. I, I just, I just wonder if we're, we're opening up a, uh, you know, a, a can there that we may not be able to put back in the, back into the can. So, um, I, I'm open to the idea, but I think I, I'd really want to see, you know, what the impact would be with that. Cause restaurants just have a, you know, depending on where they are, <laughs> um, I, I would be curious to see what impact that would have if, the, you know, depending on the location. So for example, if it was around affordable housing, uh, are we going to treat those residents a little bit different? So I want to be careful about, uh, you know, set, you know, moving forward with that. But I do agree that we need to have the same standards. I think that we can't put our brick and mortars at a, at a, um, a disadvantage. So, um, if we're going to lift it for them, let's lift it for the brick and mortar. Um, so should food trucks be allowed to operate and stay on site at, at um, and, and let me, this gets to my question. So, um, cause I was reading through the minutes here and, um, I just want to make sure that I understand what that means, uh, in terms of a commissary kitchen, does this allow folks to just go ahead and prepare their food, um, uh, you know, at their home? Um, I mean, help me understand, you know, what we're, what we're, we're driving at here with this question here, the second one. Yep. Yeah, thanks, Councilmember Lohman. So um, it would not allow people to prepare food at their home. The commissary kitchen would need to be in a licensed commercial kitchen. And so this allows you know, a food truck to operate at that site and be stored at that same location. So that's what the question is about. So if we take that license away, does the food truck license, is that going to include that same standard? I just want to make sure I'm, I'm following this, that you, you you still have to follow that same same standard in terms of food preparation. Um, so I, I wasn't following you a little bit there. Uh, if we take a license away, was that referring to the um, commissary kitchen or the food truck? Because they're like separate. Well, I know they're separate. And that's the idea that they would be be separate. But what is the standard now that would be underneath that commissary or under the the new food truck license? Is that this is it the same standard as the commissary uh, license, or is that just a, a end way around? Why would I still need to have a you know that other license? That that's what I'm trying to understand. Why 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 do I why am I why wouldn't I just put them underneath one of the I others? See. I'm just trying to understand. Ms. Sean, Morton, you help us out. Yes, thank you, Mayor. Uh, Council Member Lohman. So all food trucks and licensed kitchens all operate under the state's food code. So that goes into great detail about cooking and cleanliness and hand washing and um, keeping food safe, reducing foodborne illness, right? That's why we do this. So the same code applies to food trucks as it does to restaurants. Um, most food trucks I would say all food trucks need to do their prep work somewhere. And we don't want them to do it in a home kitchen. And the reason we don't want them to do it at a home kitchen is we don't license or inspect home kitchens. So in order to have good food safety, we do need them to do, you know, store their, you know, excess ingredients, have a walk-in cooler, or have some commercial refrigeration that they can count on have um, a place where they can fill their water tanks and, and places where they can go and also dump their waste tanks. So um, every food truck really does need to have a place to go and restock, prep food for the day. Um, the reason they can turn out the food so quickly to you is because it's already been cut up sometimes pre-cooked and cooled down, they're just reheating for you. So all the same standards that we inspect to at a restaurant, those same standards have to be upheld in a food truck. And for those reasons, that's why it's so important to license them to give the city the ability to then inspect them and make sure the food is safe. And shut them down if it's not, right? And get correction and, and things like that. So. That, did I answer your question? Yeah, I just wanted to make sure that there wasn't some end run way around. And I, I thought I read it that way, but I just want to make sure that I, I, I absolutely read it the right way. So with that being said, then, you know, I, I don't see any reason why, I mean, in that last one, 
why why you wouldn't be able to do that. I mean, it just, just totally makes sense to me. But um, is, was there something more that you were looking for with that? I just I don't I don't even really, even understand the question. <laughs> so I'm just kind of. Yeah, thanks. I can clarify a little bit. So, um, you know, initially we drafted the ordinance with the understanding that food trucks wouldn't stay at the same site they're operating. You know, we wanted them to leave and come back the next day if they wanted. Um, you know, part of it was uh, some of the planning commission's comments, concerns about, um, you know, if there's um, maybe sites not being kept up, if the food truck is just left there. I know there's concerns in other cities about you know food trucks becoming immobile if they're left to just sit there too long um but i i'm hearing that there's openness to allowing food trucks at the same site as a commissary um well if i could maybe ask maybe let me ask it this way if we open this this up what would be our way of closing this down so if we began to see let's say there's crime around this or some kind of issue what how would we go about kind of restricting this or once we open this this up are we a little more locked into having it open yeah thanks council member or loman so i suppose the easy answer is to take the license away <laughs> I might defer to um miss moore on that too Mayor, Ms. Council Moore. Member Lohman. Um, those are excellent questions. Um, I think maybe a way to explain that last question a little easier is we can envision that a restaurant might want a food truck, right? And as a restaurant, you might want to have your restaurant operating and have the food truck operating and maybe be, you know, a lot of times food trucks will focus on one item, right? One simple item that's really good. Um, they might prep it in the restaurant, but they want to sell this one quick grab-and-go item outside. So really think about having a restaurant operating at the same time their food truck is operating and on the same site. And I think that's really what the question's getting at. Um, you know, we don't, I look at it as um, the idea of we don't want the permanent food truck, you know, with flat tires, never moving from the same spot because you got to fill the tanks, you got to empty the sewage, um, you got to go back and restock, you got to clean, you got to you got to keep it running. Right. And um, so that's the idea about moving. But if it's your location and your restaurant, it's not competing with you. It's it's contributing to your food sales. Right. So I think the question is really, you know, do we want that type of scenario to happen and same with like tap rooms that can't really have food on site they want the food trucks there to you know build their business right but you want because the tap room doesn't own the food truck you know the food truck needs to go back to its commissary at night so I just want to walk through so that everybody really understands kind of what that means and hopefully I did and I, I appreciate that clarification because that was the question that I had about if a restaurant owns the food truck and it's parked at the restaurant, could they be both? Of course it's going to be parked there. Parked um, there. We see that all the time. We but, have but the question then was operating there as well. Right. That was, that was the question. Yep, yeah. that is the question. And, and I can see it happening. And I can see why, you know, that might be appealing to operators and owners of a restaurant to do exactly mm -hmm. that thing. It makes sense. And I guess if it's in their parking lot, then they're not impeding on anyone else. And right. But we do end up, I guess, we could consider, you know, then it, it, not quite a drive-through, a, a quasi-drive-through with a quick grab-and-go, people driving up and getting, you know, the, the the three fish tacos and going again. And so, I mean, it's, and until I think we run into issues like that or problems like that, I think this makes sense to approve it in this way and, and deal with issues once they come up. Right. And, and if we did have issues, you know, we can always take a step back and kind of dissect what's going on and what the problem is. Is it yeah. traffic flow? Is it a dangerous situation? Um, you know, what are our concerns and how can we make it better? Or, you know, see, you know, it's happening in other cities right yep. now. And I, I just don't think it's been an issue. So, yep. I mean, that's Agreed. what I've heard. So the other question that I had is, is you brought up odor control standards. Um, given the recent discussions we've had about noise control, has there been, have there been issues anywhere with food trucks regarding noise control and noise control standards? Uh, I mean, we've 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 had that discussion here, and frankly, 
the food truck annoyance that I have is not the smell, it's that sound of the generator that's running constantly. Mayor, that's a that's a good question. You know, that might be another reason why in residential areas you don't want to just open end a food truck, you know, to operate as many days as they want at, you know, a residential setting. I think you can imagine um, outside of an apartment building or something. And um, I, I know because we take complaints where neighbors across the street in their single family homes don't like that the tenants park on the street. How would they like it if there was a food truck parked on the street every night? So, I, I mean, I think, I think you know, we gotta have some give and take. And remember, a lot of this is gonna be complaint-based. I mean, we don't have staff to go out every night and track food trucks or know where they're operating or a lot of this. I think, I think we're gonna be relying on our residents to let us know when it's a problem and when we need to take a closer look at some of these specific things like noise Odor, I'm gonna tell you, odor control in food trucks is really tough. Um, I, I, I just don't know how possible it is. I'm just gonna be honest, we're on a restaurant, it's, it's pretty common, especially you know, these days, that uh, a, new, a new restaurant's gonna have odor control on their you know, cooking exhaust hood. So I, I mean, it's just put it in perspective, you know, uh, restaurants are much more expensive. You know, let's just be blunt there. I mean, their ventilation system you could buy a couple of food trucks for a you know, commercial kitchen ventilation system with all the odor control. It's just not really realistic, maybe, to have odor control on food trucks. Just gonna, just gonna say it. Thank you. Councilmember D'Alessandro. Follow-up question. Um, uh, does the commissary kitchen or, or restaurant have to be within a certain number of miles of, of where the the um the food truck operates uh, like like for example um i'm making this up but let's say uh you had an a food truck operating out of northfield a pizza shop food truck operating out of northfield and they wanted to come to the bloomington farmers market their commissary kitchen is in northfield but they are going to operate here is that is that typical is that are there limits to those things like what what's generally the accepted practice there Mayor, Council Member D'Alessandro, that happens all the time. So at our farmer's market now, we have food vendors and that come from all over and come here, and we like that, right? We want to bring right. that variety in. Um, I think, you know, it's mobile. If they, they have to have refrigeration on the truck um, that works, um, if they can travel and uh, get here and serve food safely, uh, that's just not an issue for us. Um, they'd have to have our local license, you know, that's what we're asking for. Um, but um, people do it. People come to Summerfet, co people come to Heritage Days, sure. um, come to the farmer's market. You know, we see folks from all over the state. So there is a separation intentionally of the food truck license. How do you inspect their commercial kitchen then? Very good question, Mayor, Council Member D'Alessandro. We don't, we're gonna rely on our colleagues in the district where their, where their commissary kitchen is located. Okay. We do this all the time yep. um, with caterers and stuff. Um, call up our colleagues in Minneapolis and say, hey, such and such catering company is doing this event in Bloomington. Uh, you know, can you tell me if this, their address is legit and they're licensed? I mean, we're doing that all the time. Okay. Thank you. So moving this along here, folks. Uh, so the the question I think about being allowed and and operating a stay on site at the commissary kitchen and restaurant. I think we're in agreement there that that probably makes sense. It's just kind of logical. Uh, the question about uh, exempt from odor control standards. Um, I mean, a, a couple of good comments regarding the odor control. But I think the best comment is probably from Ms. Moore when she's saying how basically it's very, very difficult to control odors out of a food truck. And so uh, I guess I would lean toward probably saying, yes, that makes sense, uh, just because we're, uh, I don't know how we can impose odor control standards without having food trucks say, well, then we're just not going to Bloomington because we don't have this on the top of our truck. So it's a tricky one. I uh, understand your, your point, Councilmember Loman, that Consistency would be good, but we have we have we have two different 
two different entities. We got the, the brick and order, we got a food truck as well. So uh, don't know, Councilmember D'Alessandro, if I agree with your thought about eliminating them everywhere, but we can have that discussion elsewhere. So at another time. Councilmember Lohman. You know, thank you, Mayor, and I, I agree. Now, given that, that statement, I think it makes a lot more sense if it's going to be practically difficult to do it. But I, I do think I agree uh, here that we ought to, ought to look for ways in which to try to level that, that playing field. And I think that that's the point that I heard uh, that uh, Councilman de was, was saying there. And so if we can look to find ways, and we may not be in the older standards, but it may be somewhere else. Yep, understood. Yes, Mr. Mayor, generally speaking, I'm just for more restaurants in Bloomington, and I'd like us to not have so many barriers to their that's entry, good. and that's really more my comment than anything, and and I, at least from the folks that I got the chance to talk to, I heard that, you know, food trucks are going to get in before we can get in is kind of like the sentiment behind that statement, so. Yep, yeah. got it. Fair enough, thanks. Uh, so staff is, uh, they proposed a, a, a pilot approach, a one-year trial to see how this all works, and I think the general question, the overall question, do we want to schedule an ordinance for a public hearing on this before the council? So we think that two and a half years is long enough time to be <laughs> mulling this over and we can... I think, uh, yes, we're ready to go on a public hearing, staff. Let's, uh, let's go to it. I think everybody thumbs up on that? Good. I would be very happy to do so. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. James. Thank you, Ms. Moore. I appreciate it. We addressed item 8.2. Our final item of the evening is item 8.3, our city council policy and issue updates. Mr. Verbrugge. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and council members. Uh, I have a couple of items for you this evening. First of all, a reminder that we have the State of the City address this Wednesday. It is in person again for the first time since 2019. Uh, so we'll see how the new mayor does it delivering a state of the city address for the first time you know this is going to be an interesting experience for all of us i think um i do want to remind the council that your um uh your attendance and and participation is certainly welcome so uh if you can you can still let mr brillhart know uh we'll get you registered so that you can be there we have until the end of the day tomorrow to get uh, folks registered uh, and for the public, if, if you wish to attend, it is at the Radisson Blue at uh, Mall of America. It's a very nice venue. Uh, it's a lovely lunch opportunity. So if you're free in the middle of the day, uh, it's from 11 until about 1.30 or so. Does that sound right? Councilmember Carter? Councilmember Carter? Thank you, Mayor. So I just wanted to clarify, because I think it's important for people to, to know this, that it is a chamber hosted yes. Yes. and organized event. Um, you know, I know for myself in the past, before I was on council, I was always so confused by why there was a cost and all these things. And so I just think it's important for people to realize that the chamber really is the one that hosts and organized that event. Yes. And I appreciate that clarification, council member Carter. So if somebody just showed up and, and uh, wondered why they couldn't be seated, that's why we need the RSVPs and it is a pay to attend event. Um, we will uh, we, we will um, make sure that the video of the event is available for viewing uh, so that folks can see the state of the city address as well um, because it is recorded, it is live streamed. <clears throat> so um, if somebody doesn't wish to attend in person, they'll still be able to see it. So, uh, Council may have heard from some uh, constituents that valuation notices have been landing on doorsteps. Uh, and in mailboxes, uh, and hopefully they haven't been crumpled up and thrown at people because, frankly, the valuation notices, I think, are um, surprising quite a few people. Uh, I've heard uh, just today from uh, two folks at, uh, at my local Rotary Club that their uh, valuations have gone up 27%. And so <clears throat> the city assessor will be coming into the council to make his annual presentation on April 11th. Uh, so I want to make clear for folks um, that there is an appeal process. If people feel that their property is being uh, unfairly or incorrectly valued, uh, that information is right on the notice. Uh, we have... Our local board of appeal and equalization is meeting, I believe, on April 20th of this year. And we ask residents to submit their appeal information by April 8th um, so that 
the the board has adequate time to prepare information and consider their appeal, um, but we don't require that. So walk-ins are welcome on the 20th of April at that meeting. Um, it's But it does require some preparation, and uh, there's also information on our website about uh, how to work through that. If you go uh, to our website and look on the city assessor's page, uh, that detail is on there as well. So the <clears throat> the assessing process for determining valuation uh, is a statutorily defined process. And, and Mr. Gershmel, our city assessor, will walk through all of that on April 11th at the council meeting. But if you do have constituents who are asking questions, you can certainly refer them to the city assessor or let them know that um, if they're just interested in hearing more about it, that that presentation will be coming up at the city council meeting. And then uh, uh, my last comment uh, is, again, acknowledging that this is the last uh, meeting for uh, Chief Hartley. Uh, he's probably doing a little happy dance over there that um, this is his last council meeting. Uh, you know, when I, when I first arrived here seven years ago and uh, met Chief Hartley, uh, at that time uh, relatively new as the deputy chief, uh, Mike shared with me that uh, he and I were both from Columbia Heights. Um, I, I, we were in the high school for exactly one year together, um, as is clear by all of the additional gray hairs on Mike's head that I don't have. Uh, he's, he's three years older than I am. Um, and I didn't know him in high school because he was a too cool senior and I was just a lowly freshman. Um, he, he mentioned something about uh, knowing who I was. So, uh, you know, I don't know why that is. I probably had a bad rap or something. I don't believe that. So uh, <laughs> uh, it was nice to have that commonality in the whole time that I've been here. Um, and Mike and I always joke there's something about being a Heights guy. And uh, it's nice to have um, that that um, point of relativity uh, in our relationship. I just want to – and, and I, I start there um, because uh, – it's important to understand where Mike comes from is an awful lot about who he is. And uh, he's, he's just a good guy, as the mayor mentioned earlier. Um, one of the things that I have certainly appreciated about uh, the chief's uh, leadership, and you heard it here tonight when we were swearing in the officers, is his focus on the whole person and not just the fact that they are a law enforcement officer. These are people who come to this job as sons and daughters and husbands and wives, and um, you know they bring their whole self to work. And uh, Mike cares about their whole selves as um, officers and as um, employees of the city of Bloomington and the Bloomington Police Department. And <clears throat> I think that that kind of uh, personal care in his leadership style uh, is one of the reasons that he is so uh, universally respected and appreciated, I think, by the police officers of BPD. So, um, Mike, I just want to uh, say for everybody uh, how much we appreciate uh, your service and um, uh, thank you for the time that you've spent at the City of Bloomington Police Department. Is he still over there? I mean, he's... Okay, just making sure. Cause... <laughs> yeah, I, I... Well, I think you should just come up here. Yeah, so... Um, and, and, and just a, uh, a genuine thank you uh, for your time here and, and uh, really appreciate both as a, a coworker and a supervisor that uh, you, you've, you've done a tremendous job helping in the leadership of the Bloomington Police Department. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor, City Council. It, uh, as I said earlier, it's, uh, it's been a, a pleasure of mine to serve this city. This is a, a great place to raise a family as I have. <clears throat> the schools are great. Uh, the people are great. I'm going to miss it. And, uh, you know, I think if uh, I, I'll agree with you that uh, not that I disagree with you a lot, but um, <laughs> I, I think it is important now more than ever. And I, I address the families at the reception that, um, you know, this is, a, this is a tough profession and there's a lot of people that are no longer going to go into this. Uh, we've got a really good class that was behind me tonight. They're going to have great careers here. They're going to serve the people very well. And I've just enjoyed my time. I've been very fortunate to uh, uh, you know, uh, have opportunities here, and uh, I'm going to miss it. So I will, uh, you know, I'm encouraged by what we saw here tonight. We anticipated maybe a little bit of a rough road with some people that didn't agree with, but in the end, 
there was commonality and that was good to see. So I'm, I'm encouraged, but uh, appreciate all of your service to this city and uh, the support that you've given this police department over my 25 years. So thank you very much. Anything else, Mr. Verbrugge? Council, anything to bring forward tonight? Councilmember D'Alessandro and Councilmember Lohman. Councilmember D'Alessandro. So thank you for bringing up the property value assessment stuff, uh, Mr. Verbrugge. We heard from one of the residents this afternoon. You know, the, uh, the, the, um, it is really complicated, and I know that we talked with, uh, with um, our budget manager, Ms. Carlson, about making sure that the calendar for all of this is really well understood by people because um, even if we chose in September not to um, assess any additional levy, um, you know, Hen between Hem Hennepin County and the Watershed District and the Public School District and things like that, you know, they're, they're operating from that number. And, um, and so people will, will be impacted by that, right? Um, I don't know. I, I've asked several times, I think, when I've been up here to, to talk about, like, what we can do to help our seniors in terms of alleviating some burden. I mean that not just from a, an age perspective, but, you know, it is a, um, it is, it is a challenge for, it, it, you know, our seniors more and more are of lower income. Um, they, you know, they, they, um, the uh, social security and other things that they might depend on don't, don't necessarily, um, uh, increase at the same rate that these things do. Right. And so to the extent that we can find any way to provide that, um, I think I copied some of you on the note I sent to house and Senate chambers as well, asking them if they could do something, for example, like cap the, uh, increase that, that can be used to assess to assess taxes, right? Um, even if it goes up 17%, you can't use more than a 5% differential if you are below a certain income or, you know, have a property value of a certain kind or whatever. And I know Representative Carlson is looking into that. So I wanted to make note of that. To the extent that you all feel like you can use your um, influence at the legislature as well to try to help with some burden relief here, um, the problems need to be solved they get solved by more affordable housing, as we know. Um, that doesn't fix it this year. That fixes it, you know, two, three, five years from now, right? We can't fix it this year, but maybe we can do something. So I'll throw that out there. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up, um, I believe we all got public comment um, via email regarding No Mo May and the fact that we have, it's spring, I'm so excited. So um, I would I would like, I, I know that the way that it works today is if, um, as we do our inspections throughout the city, um, if people are in quote unquote violation of a, of our standards, um, they get ticketed and then they can kind of, or they get noticed, I should say. Um, and then they can tell the, the, the group that, oh no, I'm participating in OMO May and it kind of all goes away, whatever. Um, I'd like to see us be more proactive about that and be more thoughtful about that. Um, I know, um, the standards that we talk about for what grass should look like and what kind of grass and all this kind of stuff. And, um, I'll spare I'll spare the the historical race tinged and other tinged uh, reasons for why those things exist. I don't think that we're doing any of that on purpose, but those things exist in large part to keep people and com certain communities um, homogeneous, if you will, uh, homogenous. And um, so let's not do that. Let's uh, instead focus on our natural environment and focus on the ways that we can um, better serve um, using you know, corridors for our, our pollinators and other things like that. Um, so I'd like to see if we can, um, maybe, I don't want to say don't, don't do our, you know, grass review or whatever we do, but let's be proactive about being a part of, of being a P bee pollinator city, being more proactive about, you know, uh, we, we talk a lot about our native garden out here in front of chambers, but, um, you know, Let's encourage that citywide, right? There, there is a movement in this city for people who want this. I can promise you, you're not going to get a whole lot of pushback uh, from a whole lot of people. Um, and I think we can do a lot for our environment by by just some minor tweaks to the way that we enforce some of the things we do, especially in the springtime. So um, I don't know if anybody else would like to comment on that, but um, I throw that out there for consideration. And um, I'd appreciate, you know, Mr. Verbrugge, if you if you have any thoughts on that or if we can come back before May to at least help people understand maybe it's just a less top Bloomington or a Bloomington briefing thing or something, but you know, a way to really help encourage that instead of discourage it. That would be great. Thank you. 
Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Lohman, then Council Member Carter, and then Council Member Coulter. We'll come right down the line here. Well, you got a lot here. Well, um, I, I just wanted to just mention that uh, uh, a number of us were uh, in D.C. Uh, over the, the last uh, couple of days here, this last week here, and I'm not sure if other folks want to mention what they did because I wasn't there for the, the whole time. I did get the opportunity to attend um, a couple of different classes, and I'll just kind of talk a little bit about those. I had an opportunity to, to talk about uh, – uh, attend one class on cyber attacks on local governments, um, which they are rapidly increasing, which was uh, it's actually pretty interesting to kind of see uh, uh, what a number of these cities were dealing with. And uh, so that, that, that discussion um, is something that I did talk with the city manager just briefly about and something that I think we ought to be um, uh, mindful of and be prepared for um, as those uh, – as these things continue to increase, they, they uh, reflect and can impact uh, our resilience as a, as a city and also can have a su substantial uh, financial impact as well. So we want to be uh, continuing to, to keep our eyes on that, and uh, that was a very interesting one. And then I had the opportunity to attend a leading in the moment, a uh, kind of a new approach for frontline leaders, and, and this uh, – uh, was probably a little more challenging. It had a lot of meditation uh, in it and uh, mindfulness uh, and trying to focus in on what things you want to uh, see uh, change or things you want to see change within your own leadership, which I thought was a real uh, helpful uh, type class uh, for myself. And there was certainly more about that. And then the last class uh, that I want to talk about of the other ones that I attended was um, really about the infrastructure bill. Uh, and they had talked about how uh, the... Um, the, the U.S. Um, Department of Transportation has really kind of set stepped forward with kind of this idea around zero deaths on roads across uh, uh, the country, and they've really kind of put together um, a number of different grants and proposals that will allow uh, local municipalities to be able to take advantage of of those uh, grant dollars that are out there, and also the um, uh, earmarks that are also a part of the uh, the federal. Uh, uh, dollars that are out there. So just another just really great opportunity. And, and of course, it was tough to cover that for so many different municipalities uh, and how you kind of go about doing that. And I know that we have been taking advantage of some of those things or in the process of, of trying to trying to take advantage of it. And I would encourage us uh, to do that, uh, given uh, our competitiveness as we continue to, to try to be, uh, you know, a, a remarkable city as we move forward. Council Member Carter. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I am supportive, definitely, of you know promoting and encouraging residents, make sure they understand that they can participate in NOMOME. I know, I remember last year we got quite a few emails about that, and so I think there's definitely significant interest out there in the community. And then I would be interested in learning more about you know becoming a bee city and what does that really mean? What is the commitment? Um, is that something the Sustainability Commission could look at? And I know that their work plan is in place for 2022, but you know, as we continue to plan, I think it's definitely something that we want to keep on the radar and, and think through and consider. Uh, the other thing that I just wanted to mention quickly, uh, so Council Member D'Alessandro and I uh, were able to meet with some representatives from Bloomington Remembers Veterans earlier today. And I understand that they're going to be coming and presenting to the City Council, I think in April. And I actually would like to propose that we um, take a step to provide a resolution of support for their efforts. They are asking as council members individually for us to really support them as they fundraise to get to $700,000. And so in addition to the resolution, I would just love, whether it's just a follow-up email from Melissa, some better understanding about what we as council members can do in our role to help them in their efforts I mean, obviously, we have great self-interest in this. Not only do we want to do the, it's the right thing to do, but it's going to be right out here. And, you know, the sooner that we can get that project done, the better. Uh, so I think they indicated that a resolution of support would be helpful for them as they um, are trying to get funding for this project. And um, anything else that we can do at the individual level or council level, it'd be really helpful to understand that better. Thank you. And I can tell you, Councilmember Carter, they they might be featured at the State of the City as well. <laughs> so, Councilmember Coulter. Thank you, Mayor. Well, I will be quick here since we're obviously getting to the end here. Um, 
uh, I think it was towards the end of last year when we adopted our final levy, um, I requested that staff would come back and update us on um, other what other metro cities did in terms of their final levies and, and what that kind of looked like. And, and I think we're far enough now into the year that, that the Department of Revenue should have all of that information. So um, just would like to see some, some follow up on that request. I think it'd be helpful for us as council members and, and for the community to know a little bit more about what that looks like. Um, and then the only other thing I was gonna bring up now that we are back for in-person meetings, uh, we did this, I think, like four or five times, and then the pandemic shut everything down. But we had the welcome committee, where where council members would greet folks um, as they as they come in for council meetings. And um, now that we're all back in person, I, I think that uh, that it's something that's something worth reviving. I would agree with you. I hadn't thought about this. I didn't kind of put it all together. Is the excitement of having everyone here, it uh, kind of slipped my mind, but um, I think that's a very good idea. In fact, uh, uh, for our council member D'Alessandro, what we did, we had folks there just saying hello and handing out agendas and answering any questions about might, what uh, might come up, what's on the agenda, so I absolutely think we should definitely do it again, so yes. Yes. Anything else, council? Don't see any hands up. With that, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to adjourn tonight's meeting. No further council discussion on this. All those in favor, please say bye. Aye. 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 Opposed? We are adjourned. Thank you all very much. Thanks so much for your work tonight. Good meeting. Very good meeting. Thank you much uh, to the folks who were here and the great input they had. And thank you, as always, to staff. Night, folks. Have a good night.